I know that we have a tight timeline to keep a quorum. So I'm going to call this meeting of the governing board of the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District to order. Uh, good morning and welcome to our meeting of the Air Pollution Control District. We have board members participating in person and via Zoom webinar. We will do our best to facilitate a smooth meeting with public participation via Zoom and webcast. Before we begin, here are some important guidelines and general instructions for the meeting. Please silence your other communication devices, such as your cell phone or desk phone. This will ensure that we are not hearing any feedback that can interrupt the meeting. During the meeting, all public participants, except for board members and district staff, will be placed on mute by the host. Public members will not be able to mute or unmute manually. Only the board members and staff will be visible on Zoom. Audio for members of the public will be unmuted once they are recognized to make public comment. After each agenda item, the chair will announce public comment. The clerk will recognize any public attendee who has indicated they wish to speak. So we'll move on to item number two, uh, the roll call. Good morning, thank you. Mr. Bessinger. Here. Mr. Chiesa. Here. Mr. Couch. Ms. Fugazi. Ms. Lewis. Mr. Mendez. Here. Dr. Pacheco Warner. Here. Mr. Pereira. Mr. Peterson. Here. Mr. Preciado. Here. Mr. Rickman. Dr. Sheriff. Ms. Shuklian. Here. Mr. Wheeler. Here. <laughs> All right, thank you, we have a quorum. That's perfect. And I just want uh, the public to know there's an extraordinary effort going on right now. It's the Rural County Representatives of California. It's their annual uh, meeting. So the uh, some people are joining us from that. And so we appreciate your time and effort. All right, uh, I'm gonna ask, how about if I ask uh, Member Bessinger if you would lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Thank you very much. Move on to approval of the consent calendar. Would any board member like to pull any items for comment? Uh, Mr. Chair and, and members of the board, just wanted to uh, bring to your attention a, a letter that was received uh, late uh, yesterday evening requesting that this uh, item be pulled off the consent agenda. Just wanted to, to make sure you were aware of that and. Uh, something that the board can uh, can consider doing as, as part of the consent calendar here. We're happy to provide a, a brief presentation on that item if that's the desire of the board. Which item is it, Samir? It's item, sorry, I apologize. It's item number 22 on the consent calendar. But you, is someone calling in to comment on it or is it just a written comment? It is a written comment. I don't see no reason to pull it. They, they can still make comments if you want to. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, no board members have any comment on any item. And so I'm going to go. Oh, Let's sorry. This is, this is um, Pacheco Warner. I did, they did, that letter did have some questions. I, I wanted to see if um, the um, staff could respond to. We can do that. Okay. Sorry about the crying baby in the background. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, reviewing the letter it appears that um, it's being requested to be removed from the consent calendar and put on the regular standalone calendar. Through the chair, Mr. Pereira has joined the meeting. Thank you. Is Samir, is there, uh, are there questions in it that you can uh, address? Yeah, we um, we haven't had a chance to, you know, given the, the late nature of the the comment letter, we haven't had a chance to review their their comments. Um, they appear to be primarily centered on the uh, EIR process that's <clears throat> continuing to move forward at the uh, at the city of Bakersfield. 
uh, related to, to CEQA. Uh, it's something that we'd be happy to continue reviewing as we get more time to understand, you know, their, their particular comments and concerns. Uh, this VERA is, is not unlike uh, similar uh, voluntary agreements that have been requested to assist in mitigating the air quality impacts from these projects. So I, uh, we'd be happy to provide more of an overview on that if any of the board members were interested in hearing this item separately. Uh, but it is last minute uh, letter and we don't, we don't have much of a response to this point to letter. Mr. Uh, Chairman. Okay, uh, Supervisor Wheeler, go ahead. I, you know, we get these all the time. We get them at 7.30 in the morning sometimes for our board meeting. We just do not allow that. We just, you know, we can, they want to talk about it right now and call in before we vote on it. That's fine. And, uh, but going over and reading this stuff the night before, the day before, when they've had it out for a week, you know, it, it's just ridiculous how they people do that. And it just tries to hold up the system. And I'm not ready to do that. I'm, if they want to call in right now and, and make a statement, that's fine. If, uh, Otherwise, uh, I would, I'm ready to make a motion to approve the consent calendar. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to go out. Uh, I'm going to ask if there's any public comment on this item. Good idea. <laughs> yes, we have one pub public comment, and it's just a reminder. This is for the consent calendar. Right. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes. We can. Great. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Perry Ellert, staff attorney for Leadership Counselor for Justice and Accountability, here to comment on consent calendar item 22, approval of the voluntary emissions reduction agreement with Majestic Realty. Leadership Council works alongside residents throughout the San Joaquin Valley who are most impacted by pollution, including the community of Greenfield, which is where this over a million square foot warehouse development project plans on being located. I'm here today to ask that this board not approve the emissions reduction agreement because the air quality analysis it relies on is fundamentally flawed. There are two key flaws in the air analysis done by the city of Bakersfield. First, it does not account for the use of transportation refrigeration units, which have much higher emissions than typical diesel trucks. In fact, CARB commented on the proposed project during the CEQA process and noted that TRUs needed to be included in the analysis but nevertheless, they were not included. The second key flaw in the analysis is it vastly underestimates uh, emissions from trucks by relying on a low vehicle miles traveled estimate of 50 miles. It's hard to comprehend how a million square foot warehouse that will generate over 500 truck trips a day will have those trucks only traveling 50 miles. 50 miles won't even get you outside of Kern County. The estimate should be based on likely destinations of these trucks instead. And though, uh, given those fundamental flaws in the air analysis, you know, one can see how those emissions could result in a very low estimate of this project's emissions. This emissions reduction agreement relies on these flawed estimations. Thus, if you approve the agreement, the project would be allowed to move forward and allow excess unmitigated emissions, forcing air quality and public health <laughs> and allow the developer to avoid paying the district the full amount necessary under CEQA and the ISR rules for the district. Um, my last point is that residents near the proposed project site ask if the VERA or ISR rule fees are collected, the district take into consideration public input for mitigation projects that would directly benefit those residents who live closest to the development site and are going to be mostly directly impacted by this project. I uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Any other public comment on this item? No public comment in Fresno. Uh, Mr. Chair and board members, I just wanted to provide you um, a quick response to the uh, comment, maybe a, just a, important information related to the, the concerns that were raised. Uh, number one, uh, the district has also commented on, on the, uh, the project and we're recommending a number of uh, mitigation measures, uh, similar to I think some of the measures that were discussed uh, there and I just wanted to make sure that was clear that that, that work continues as, as the project works its way through the um, the CEQA process. Uh, the, the agreement that's being presented before your board today is and is based on the estimate uh, based on the on the current understanding of the project and where the the CEQA uh, estimates are today. If those numbers were to go up, if the, the emission uh, impact from the project were to go up or down depending on on the incorporation of more mitigation or uh, revisions to the estimates, 
that that amount would have to be updated as well to make sure that the the full commitment in this case to mitigate the the, the full emissions from the project are 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 met. And so, just want to provide that clarification that that is based on the on the latest estimates of the impact from the project, but that it wouldn't lock the uh, the mitigation to that amount if if that estimate were to be were to be updated. Is that the continual evaluation occurs with the project? And to be clear, that the 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 commitment that uh, is being made as part of the project here is to mitigate the to net zero the uh, the emissions impact from from the project. That's what the the agreement here is. It's not a, an endorsement of the project. This is not a land use decision before you today. This is the uh, the project developer uh, asking for uh, for us to assist in basically mitigating the full impact of the project. And again, that's that's not a, a fixed number. That 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 would be subject to that final certification of the EIR and whatever numbers are. Or in that EIR, just want to make sure that clarification was was there as you considered action on the item. All right, thank you very much for those comments. Me clarification. Too. Anyone else to speak uh, from public comment or from pu the public? No public comment in Fresno. Okay, I'm going to bring it back to uh, the board. I made that motion. Will the board. I still made the okay. same. Okay, I have a motion to approve the consent calendar from. Supervisor Wheeler, Member Wheeler. Shuckley in second. Second. Shuckley in. All right. Shuckley in second. Do we have to do roll call? Yes, we do. Dr. Pacheco Warner, did you have a comment? Hi, I just had a question for Samir. Um, what's not clear to me is um, in the further, the next steps, will there be a reevaluation or is it a reevaluation at this point will happen through litigation? of, you know, including for the inclusion of the TRU uh, unit pollution. I can, I can, I can respond. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm happy to provide a quick response to that. Yes, please. Yeah, the, the questions along those lines in terms of what the ultimate um, mitigation measures are required by the city and, and, and including also the final analysis of the uh, the emissions, you know that that is at the city level, uh, Dr. Pacheco Werner. Uh, so, just to clarify, whatever is included in that final EAR document with respect to ultimate certification and approval by the city, if that were to occur, would would be what ultimately the mitigation uh, uh, that would be required under under this agreement. So, I just I'm the, it's still up to the city to determine exactly what's in that EAR and. And ultimately to approve that that EIR, so that that is at the city level through the land use process. We don't we don't play a role in, in approving or requiring any of that. That's a land use decision. Did that clarify, Dr. Pacheco Warner? Thank you. Uh, yes. So the EIR process that they still have to complete would be where they modify that, and if they choose not to, then um, that's that's their their decision, but right now what we're approving is um, the estimates based on what we have now, which have been pointed out that there are some things missing. Um, there's some estimates missing, is that correct? I'm not, I can't verify the last part of your comment, Dr. Pacheco Warner, I'm not aware, I can't, can't uh, comment on whether anything's missing, but you're correct in the first part of your statement that that the um, the mitigation would be based on whatever the final EIR would would include, which may or may not include various levels of mitigation. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, we're going to go to a roll call vote. Mr. Bessinger. Yes. Mr. Chiesa. Yes. Mr. Mendez. Yes. Dr. Pacheco Warner. No. There's this one. Shh. Mr. Pereira? Mr. Pereira? Please. Mr. Pereira, are you there? Okay, I believe we have an issue with Mr. Pereira's audio. Mr. Peterson? Aye. Mr. Preciado? Yes. Mr. Glenn? Mr. 
Ms. Shuklian? Aye. Thank you. Mr. Wheeler? Yes. Can, can, can you see if you can get them to do a thumbs up or something that they can hear us? Mr. Pereira? Mr. Pereira? Motion passes. We can't hear Mr. Pereira at this time. Hello. So we need eight affirmative votes for the motion to pass. Can you see? I, I can see him now. I see. You can see him. Did he give you a thumbs up? He didn't. Yes, thumbs up. There he is. There he is. Mr. Pro, thumbs up. Okay. okay. Is a yes. Motion passes. We okay, perfect. Votes. He has service like I have service. <laughs> That's way. <funny. laughs> <Me too. laughs> Thank you very much, Lloyd. All right, we're going to move on to item five, the public comment period. Uh, it's a time made available to uh, uh, talk about anything that is in the subject jurisdiction of the Air Board. Uh, there will be time limited. If you are participating on Zoom uh, video conference, please press the raise hand yeah, button. I vote yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Thank you. Um, Thank if you're you. participating on Zoom video conference, please press the raise hand button on the participants list so that you may be recognized to speak. If you're participating on Zoom audio conference, please press star nine so that you may be recognized to speak. Also star six to mute and unmute yourself. So star nine to be recognized, star six to mute and unmute. Be prepared to speak when your name or the last four digits of your phone number is called. Please state your name prior to beginning your public comments. And we're going to go, Adriana, is there anyone for public comment? We have public comment online. Ms. Connie Young. Good morning. Can you hear me? I can hear you. We can. Great. I'm Connie Young, Fresno resident, retired registered nurse, and volunteer with Citizens Climate Lobby, also known as CCL. Last month, I mentioned the fifth annual air pollution and climate change symposium that will be held both online and in person this Saturday, September 17th. Since the Air District is a public health agency, no doubt you'll want to attend this important event to hear what local doctors, engineers, and other experts from Fresno, UC Merced, and UCSF have to say about air pollution and climate change. Symposium topics will include the state of air pollution in the Central Valley. Obviously, that's of interest to everyone here today. There will be an overview of the impact of air pollution on human health given by a UCSF Fresno pulmonologist. Another physician will speak about the health impacts of climate change. Perhaps of particular interest to you, Supervisor Wheeler, will be the talk on wildfire ecosystem interactions and climate change given by a UC Merced professor in the School of Engineering. Yeah, I, seen, top I, I appreciate that. And I've seen that. Just depends how I feel with my treatments. I'm getting if I can make it or not. So, <laughs> Great. Well, I, I hope you will. Other topics will include the state of aquifer water in the Central Valley, and a talk on the role that new generation photovoltaic cells may have in addressing the increasing need for carbon-free energy. This event will be held online and in person in the UCSF building at 2823 Fresno Street on the northwest corner of Fresno and the Vizvera. Free parking will be available in the solar panel covered lot just north of the building off of Illinois Avenue. Doors will open and coffee will be served at 8 a.m. and the event will begin at 8.30 a.m. Registration is required for online and in-person participation. While you're there, please stop by the Citizens Climate Lobby table to say hello. For more information, Google Air Pollution Symposium Fresno. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. 
Another public comment, Mr. Salvador. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Thank you. Good afternoon or good morning, uh, members of the board, Mr. Chairman, Michael Salvador, I'm the police chief for the city of Atwater. And I'm here to one, commend staff for their assistance uh, to my department over the last few weeks regarding a program that you administer called the Public uh, Benefit Program for Alternatively Fueled Vehicles. Uh, the reason for my comments today is, is I would like to implore the board to look at the criteria for that grant and what a public agency needs to do or can do prior to the application for the grant. As you well know, uh, the supply chain issues in the automotive industry are delaying the delivery and of vehicles to public agencies. And those delays and the shortness of order bank uh, positions require public agencies to place orders within very, very limited scopes of time. And the placement of an order could threaten the ability of those public agencies to use that particular grant program due to its rules. So as we continue down this new road of short order banks, limited availability, um, I would implore the board to look at those uh, rules and regulations and allow public agencies to place orders when they are, when the order banks are available and then allow for the grant applications to then be forwarded and processed to contract prior to the delivery of the vehicle versus having everything having to be done prior to getting the uh, grant process uh, completed. Uh, I'd like to thank you for my three minutes and I would be available for any questions of board members uh, if they so desire. And uh, I know several of you, so you guys do know how to get a hold of me. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Chief Salvador, for your comments. I'll take them under advisement. And I just wanted to let uh, uh, Tom Wheeler know your hand is up to speak, so take it down. <laughs> Mr. Chair, I just want to let you, you, the board know as well that we, we think there are some potential um, flexibilities and ideas on how to respond to the, the comment that was just raised. We're, we're, we'll certainly reach back out to Chief Salazar and, and uh, work with, with him and other, other uh, safety departments to, to work on, on that issue and support that. Yeah, sorry, Chairman, I wanted to make a comment when everybody else is done, public comment. One more public comment, Ms. Janet Dietzkmey. Thank you. Good morning, board members and board chair and staff. This is Janet Dietzkmey. I'm a member of CVAC and I speak for those of us who have asthma. I'm addressing climate change. We have seen some very distressing sights of what climate change has done to not only the United States, but the world. Some areas are having ridiculously enormous amounts of rain and flooding. Some areas are having drought and dried to the point where even Canada is having forest fires, forests burning up. This is all a result of climate change. We were warned about this years and years ago but the modeling did not indicate how fast it was going to occur. And now we have it. We have things that leave people homeless, people losing everything, including the, some of them losing their family lives, family members' lives. We are suffering from green, greenhouse gas effects upon our planet. This is a beautiful planet. We need to protect this beautiful planet. We need to do everything that we can to lower the greenhouse gases that are the cause of what we are witnessing. To bring it locally, 
Fresno has the highest rate, Fresno County has the highest rate of childhood emergency department visits based upon the air we are trying to breathe here the cause uh, that climate change is affecting here. Please put every effort, every focus, every attempt to clean up our air here, clean up the greenhouse gases, help reduce what is happening to people globe, globally. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Janet. No more public comment online or in Fresno. Okay, none here. Any in Bakersfield? No public comment in Bakersfield. Okay, I'm gonna turn it back over to Supervisor Wheeler. Thank you, Chairman. I just, I, I haven't been down there. I went down one time and Craig wasn't there, but this is clear from March 14th, the uh, County News and National Association of Counties. I don't know if you guys can see it. Craig had his uh, picture in the magazine. I got him saved it for you, Craig. <clears throat> but it, you know, it's a hotly contested water quality rules boil over Kings County, California. Supervisor Greg Peterson discusses the impact of unclear environmental rules. And uh, that is so true and so much stuff that happens just like us on these uh, are, uh, are trying to meet all the, the requirements that the state and the feds put on us. But you know, some of the stuff we have no control over is uh, is it the pass through traffic that the feds and the state don't step up to the plate and make rules that uh, help us get uh, get out of that you know uh, bad air. And I just like to say one thing: we had an article in the Fresno Bee, which sucks. And uh, the uh, uh, when I first started really noticing the air probably 20, 30 years ago, and I come out of the mountains, about a thousand foot to 1500 foot elevation, I come into a cloud during the summer that was just like fog in the winter. And I couldn't see across the valley to uh, uh, mountains, coast range or nothing. In the last 20 years, I've been able to see it almost every day. So when people say we're not cleaning it up, we're not doing what we're supposed to do, they don't know what they're even talking about. And for uh, Michael Salvador, which I've known him a long time. Hi, Mike. Uh, we had the same problem in Dare County. Our uh, sheriff, uh, they ordered some uh, pickups and they actually canceled them on five of them. And so we do need to try to adjust that to see help these uh, places that can get these replacement automobiles. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Okay, uh, seeing no more. Public, oh, uh, member Bessinger. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I believe Mr. Cunha was going to make a comment and we didn't get, we didn't see him. Okay. Uh, is, that, is that right, Manuel? Okay, yes. For public comment, come on up, Manuel. Thank you very much. Good morning, Mr. Chair and staff and board members. Manuel Cunha, President of the Farmers League. <coughs> um, I'm here to first make a very good positive comment the tour that uh, Buddy Mendes went on when we had the ARB entire staff, the chairwoman, and some of our board members, uh, we met with our farmer who had a trucking business and having serious problems of getting trucks ordered. Can't even take this order until 2023-24. The Air Resources Board worked with us very much and the staff of the Air District. We were able to come through a solution, but the tour and the meeting that Buddy and those folks are part of really did work. And they understand the ARB staff that's in charge of the bus and truck rule have absolutely worked with our farmers to make them work because they see the problem with the manufacturers of vehicles. So that is a very positive thing I would appreciate. And I thank ARB staff and the chairwoman, but definitely Samir and his entire team and Buddy and uh, Dr. Pacheco Warner also for being part of that tour when we had it here and the tractor crushing. The second comment real fast, I've got a minute and 49, 48 seconds. I'm very disturbed upon the media that I've been seeing and I will name the company. I have no problem with that. Public radio has aired some stories that have not absolutely have not at all had the facts at all. 
it was a one-sided story. And yesterday when I got an email from one of my growers that showed every farmer's name was listed that NPR has turned out and public made public, okay, fine, for agricultural burning. And also the Farmers Tractor Program is one of the greatest programs we put together and the fastest removing of knocks out of the air and yet criticized and not good at all in the information presented to the public as I would refer to it as bad and sloppy journalism, because that's what it was. And I'm very disappointed in that because the farmers have done their part in this valley. And today you have a thing on ag burn, but we've done one heck of a job in helping cleaning up this air in this valley compared to the rest of the state. And yet we always criticize farmers are not doing anything at all. And yet we feed the world and the people that criticize happen to eat food. Apparently they're not eating pine nuts. Uh, they're being burned up anyway. So there's nothing there for them to eat except maybe the, the bark. But again, I want to come to this board and say I'm very disappointed. I want to thank the board, the staff, and even ARB on some of the great things we've done together. And we will continue, no matter if on the sloppy garbage journalism that is being put out there. So thank you very much. Emmanuel, you might stay right there because you're going to be up next. And uh, uh, one other comment there is I know in that, in one of the stories, they uh, referred to one of our board members uh, utilizing the program. And I just want to make it clear that that uh, our farm has utilized the program. I know it's my parents, but uh, if there is something available, whether it's uh, chipping trees or buying tractors, tractor replacement, uh, don't forget about uh, Chiesa Ranch because we're participants in that and cleaning the air. And so I just wanted to let, let you know. So now we're going to move on to item six, which is a report on the District Citizens Advisory Committee activities. And then we're going to take the next two items, seven and 10, so that they're action items, so that if anyone has to drop off uh, because of a quorum issue, we can get that taken care of. Thank right, you. Uh, thank you, Manuel Cunha with the Citizens of um, the CAC. I want to thank Chris Savage and the staff. I was in D.C. on the 6th of uh, September. The board meeting uh, was held. And we are continually, and I want to thank all the supervisors and all the counties helping to complete the membership of getting it for the CAC, of getting all three um, areas from the environmental, the ag and business, and the city. So thank you again, Board of Supervisors for helping to continually fill those seats. Uh, in your report is the items that was discussed. I'll just go over the major thing that uh, Shiraz Gill presented the agricultural burn program of all the good things that are going on and the funding and positive, very positive, accurate report given, accurate. Make a note of that. Additionally, uh, there was a report um, from uh, the district receiving 12 and a half or 12.9 million for near zero truck uh, program. And, uh, and that was uh, presented by Todd DeYoung. The other items was the uh, um, ERCs uh, by Morgan um, that the board has had an ongoing activity and Morgan presented a report. And the last item is 617 on environmental uh, justice group areas of uh, Lamont and Arvin, uh, where they're at with their uh, meetings and stuff. So. If there's any questions, um, I'd be happy, but I want to thank Chris Savage, uh, the vice chair, because I was in D.C. Uh, not knowing how Zoom works and how my fingers are and my glasses, uh, I wanted Chris to run it so I wouldn't uh, mess up the meeting, so I apologize for that, but thank you, Chris. Mr. Chair, if there's any comments, I'd be happy to take them. If not, I will sit down and behave. Thank you. Any questions or comments for Manuel? Seeing none. All right. Thank no. you, Manuel. We're going to move on to item seven, approve uh, enhancements to the district's burn cleaner program to provide increased incentives for the installation of natural gas or electric devices. All right. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Brian Dodds. I'm a program manager in our grants and incentives department. And it's my pleasure to be here with you this morning to seek your board's approval for the enhancements to the district's burn cleaner program. 
The district's 2018 PM 2.5 plan uh, demonstrates how the Valley will reach attainment of the federal PM 2.5 standards, which includes both a strong regulatory component and incentive-based measures. As part of the 2018 PM 2.5 plan, the district developed the wood, residential wood smoke reduction strategy in order to achieve additional emission reductions in the areas of the Valley that are needed most. As part of this strategy, Madera, Fresno, and Kern counties were design designated as hotspot counties and are subject to the most stringent no burn days under the winter wood burning curtailment program. In addition, these hotspot counties receive a higher incentive through the district's burn cleaner incentive, incentive program to encourage the replacement of wood burning devices with cleaner options, um, as well as eliminating the ability to receive incentives for installation of wood or pellet devices in areas with access to piped natural gas. The district's burn cleaner program has played a key role in reducing PM 2.5 emissions throughout the valley by replacing these wood burning devices with cleaner alternatives. Since 2009, the district has issued nearly 27,000 vouchers totaling uh, $49 million in program funds. And this program was designed to help residents overcome the financial obstacles in purchasing, in purchasing cleaner technology while also achieving cost-effective emission reductions. Incentives are available up to $4,000 through the Burn Cleaner program to replace existing wood or pellet burning devices with electric heat pumps, natural gas devices, or EPA certified heating devices, which those are only available in areas without access to pipe natural gas. The district works closely with a network of partnering hearth retailers throughout the Valley to assist residents with information and customer service throughout the purchase and installation process. As a component of the district's multifaceted regulatory incentive and outreach strategy to reduce emissions from residential wood smoke, the district also has a commitment to achieve 0.33 tons per day of emission reductions through the burn cleaner program by December 31st, 2023. Last year, your board approved the burn cleaner fireplace and wood stove change out incentive measure for inclusion in the state implementation plan. To date, the district has been able to demonstrate a total of 0.27 tons per day towards that goal. Uh, the district is currently awaiting approval of this measure for inclusion in the SIP. Uh, in the meantime, we are proceeding with the expectation that EPA will ultimately approve this request. The Burn Cleaner Program offers Valley residents the opportunity to apply for program funding through an easy to use application portal. Um, our program retailers assist residents who may not have easy access to the internet with their applications. And uh, we also accept applications the old fashioned way, so hard copy papers. Um, what, however people want to participate in the program, we can, we can help assist them. Uh, currently, residents with access to natural gas can receive up to $3,000 for the purchase and installation of a natural gas device and up to $4,000 for the purchase and installation of an electric heating device. Um, following the implementation of the hotspot strategy in 2019, the program experienced significant growth and participation. However, to date in 2022, we've seen a pretty big decline in program participation compared to the previous year. So at this point, uh, without any changes to the program, we're projecting about a 41% decline in participation rates compared to the previous year. Um, so district staff has reviewed program participation rates and, and data. We've also engaged in conversation with program retailers and participants to kind of learn more about what might be going on. Um, and through this program review of information, we've seen an increase in costs of the eligible gas devices um, by about 16% over the, over the last three years and a greater increase uh, on the wood and pellet device costs, which make up a smaller portion of our um, program participation. Um, this increase in device cost, as well as a corresponding increase in labor cost has resulted in, in higher out-of-pocket expenses for participants, which have impacted program participation. Uh, retailers have also indicated that they expect additional device cost increase before the end of the year due to inflation and ongoing supply chain issues. 
In addition to our valley-wide program, uh, the board approved community emission reduction programs for Shafter, South Central Fresno, and Stockton. All include dedicated 617 funding for burn cleaner projects. To date, there's been very limited participation within the 617 communities for these project funds uh, between the three communities. And during our uh, regular community steering committee meetings, members have provided feedback that the available incentives are not sufficient to encourage participation. Many residents have looked into the program, but due to the high out-of-pocket expenses have not been able to move forward um, with the project. And based on, on this issue, each of the communities has recently asked for an increase in incentives available for this program in order to help encourage greater participation. The a regular review of the incentive levels offered through the burn cleaner program is necessary to ensure that uh, Valley residents have the financial resources uh, necessary to purchase and install cleaner uh, alternatives to burning wood. Uh, this important program is part of the district's key priority to reduce PM emissions in order to reduce public health exposure, as well as achieving the federal air quality standards. In establishing the existing incentive levels, your board placed a emphasis in ensuring that low-income and hotspot county residents were able to offset the cost of entry-level natural gas devices through the burn cleaner programs. And this is particularly important for residents of disadvantaged and low-income communities. The proposed enhancements to the funding levels are expected to offset the recent increase in device and labor costs. This table represents the proposal uh, for your board. Um, for natural gas devices, we are proposing to increase incentives by $1,000 in both hotspot counties and non-hotspot counties, while also increasing the installation portion of these devices by $150. For electric heat pumps, we are proposing to increase incentives by $1,000 in hotspot counties and increase the incentive in non-hotspot counties by $2,000 up to $3,500. This increase would help offset the high cost of these units while also ensuring that low-income residents in non-hotspot counties would receive the same incentive level as residents in hotspot counties for both natural gas and electric devices. In addition, district staff is proposing a new incentive of $750 for residents who wish to take their wood-burning fireplace permanently out of service by cementing or bricking, or bricking in their existing fireplace. So if these enhancements are approved, district staff will work closely with our program retailers to ensure that they understand the new incentive levels um, and that they're available and that this information is passed along to interested participants. District staff will also quickly update program application materials, our website, and outreach materials to reflect these updated amounts. Any applications that are approved following board approval would immediately be funded at the higher incentive levels. And with that, today's recommendations are here before you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you for the presentation, Brian. Uh, one quick question before I go to the board for comments or questions. The hotspot, the map of the hotspots, is that available on our website so people can see and retailers know where the hotspots are? There is information on our Burn Cleaner Program website that details what the hotspot counties are and, and all of our communications with retailers reiterate that information as well. All right, thank you. Uh, Supervisor Wheeler. Unmute me here. Yeah, I just, I love this program, you know, when we first started it, <clears throat> the exempt areas weren't, uh, you know, available for that dollars, but we, after much discussion, probably 30 minutes worth, we got the, uh, got uh, the board to vote and the staff to work on uh, Eastern Madera and Eastern Fresno counties to be part of this. And I, I can't tell you how many people come up to me and thank me for getting that. I mean, I don't know how many numbers are in Fresno Madera, Eastern Madera County, but they're big numbers. So thank you, Todd, thank you, staff. And, <clears throat> and this is so important to help do things that they say we're not doing by the letter writers and public radio and TV, so <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Supervisor Mendez. Yeah, I, I think this is a great approach. You know, 
always use the economics. When a program slows down, that means that it, we need to add incentives to get it, uh, you know, jump started going. And very good. Uh, thank you for looking into this. And and uh, this is a great solution. And thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pacheco Warner. Yeah, thank you. I agree with the supervisors. This is a great program, and really thank you for the review. And I think this makes sense. Um, I think you know, in terms of sort of like the next phase of enhancements to this program, um, I wonder if you're considering, I know that right now you have the tier for gas homes. If you're considering another tier for um, solar powered homes to further incentivize the electric. Um, and this is just, you know, um, I know that that stuff will be coming down from the state around um, decarbonization and and I just want to make sure that our program, when the time comes that these decisions have sort of been made, that we're not setting up people to have stranded assets um, and that we're incentivizing um, them to move into the type of things that will be, um, you know, sort of the next generation of what's required. But thank you so much. This totally makes sense um, today for where we're at right now. Perfect. Thank you. I see no more board comments, so we will go out to the public. We have a public comment online, Ms. Connie Young. Yes, hi again, this is Connie Young. Um, as a happy owner of a heat pump, thank you very much for the um, incentive for that. Uh, I had just had a couple of comments from my experience one was I wondered if it would be possible to provide some guidelines to recipients um, about how to seal off their chimney. When I went through this, the, the company that I worked with didn't even know how to do that necessarily. So if there were suggestions, specific suggestions for how to do that, that would be appreciated along with if it's necessary to either notify the city or uh, future purchasers of a home that a chimney is sealed off, uh, that information would be useful as well. I'd also suggest updating the list of heat pump vendors. It was not up to date when I was going through that process and that required me to call people. And yeah, it would be nice if you already had that list already up to date. Last point is uh, the Inflation Reduction Act is going to be uh, providing a $8,000 upfront discount for the purchase of a heat pump, which uh, if people knew about that, in addition to the $4,000 through your program, uh, I would, I'm sure that would boost participation. So I'm hoping that you will um, include that information when promoting your program. Uh, and likewise, if in fact, solar or rooftop solar is added, the Inflation Reduction Act is going to have significant uh, incentives for doing that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Chair, if I, if I just uh, jump in really quick on this one uh, and, and just first thank Connie as one of our early uh, heat pump participants for all the uh, the great uh, guidance and uh, work that she's done to help us with, with that particular element of our program. Uh, we, we agree, you know, and we've actually updated our, our guidance with respect to the uh, the sealing process on, on fireplaces as well as added this new component on decommissioning that also came in from from her from connie as well as some other comments that have come in re related to that so very very happy to respond to that and appreciate uh, you know all the guidance that we received from her and her experience also on the um on the inflation reduction act funding and to dr pacheco warner's question we definitely have this this program designed with an eye towards uh, these different transitions that are that are going on as well as the soon to, to be availability of, of that funding and continuing to do a good job in, in communicating to the public the, the range of options and, and different um, companies that would be able to help with looking at, say, an electric heat pump system. We're absolutely aware of, of, of that and, and are going to be working towards making sure that information is available to the public so that the Valley residents can fully participate with some of these uh, new opportunities that are coming up. So I just wanted to respond to that. That's something that we're definitely keeping an eye on. Thank you. Another public comment online, Ms. Janet Jeetskamay. Thank you. 
I appreciate these efforts very much, but I need to remind that uh, during winter months, I am uh, housebound because in my neighborhood, a neighborhood where everybody has uh, an HVAC system, everybody has central air in my neighborhood, there is absolutely no need for them to use their fireplaces and yet they do. Even on no burn days, there is fireplace use in my neighborhood. And so another element of this is enforcement. We need to have solid enforcement to let these people know that no burn means no burn. I do appreciate Dr. Pacheco Warner's comments regarding solar. I have uh, mentioned that also in the past years. When they, people are moving to electric, that is a rather expensive form of energy and solar is the answer to that problem. I, I imagine solar on roofs, or solar somewhere providing uh, to the disadvantaged communities a source of energy that they can afford. As I say, I spend a lot of time inside during winter months because of the inversion. The inversion brings all of the pollutants down to where we are breathing. Thank you for these and I hope that solar will also be a part of these plans in future. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Janet. Mr. Thomas Menz. Yes, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Thomas Menz, I'm a resident of Fresno County. This is a great program. Uh, not the least because I'm in the process of taking advantage of it myself with the installation of heat pumps in my own home and uh, had a fireplace blocked, which though seldom used will never be used by anyone in the future once I'm dead and gone. So no future biomass emissions and no more natural gas emissions come winter. Uh, this program is also a great use of carrot and stick a carrot of the cash subsidy and the stick of the mandatory burning curtailments. In my own neighborhood, there are approximately half a dozen or so uh, homes that uh, received notices of violation under Rule 4901 that went on to purchase gas inserts. And um, I'm reasonably certain that whoever phoned in those violations did the residents a great favor. You know, it occurs to me it would be nice if perhaps as a pilot program, the district could work with the utility PG&E to identify all of those homes in say uh, South Fresno, uh, the AB 617 area that do not have natural gas service and proactively reach out to them. I'm sure it's a small number of homes and make sure that, especially if they're dependent on a wood burning device as a source of heat, that they be made aware of this program and be assisted in taking advantage of it together with uh, any federal subsidies that they might be able to take advantage of as Connie Young has mentioned. South Fresno has significantly higher levels of PM25 during the winter months than the designated regulatory monitors. And it seems like it would be a, a good focus of attention. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Thomas. Ms. Cynthia Pinto Cabrera. Hi, good morning, Chair and Board Members. Cynthia Pinto Cabrera here with the Central Valley Air Quality Coalition and just wanted to express um, some support for this program. It's definitely a great step in the right direction to be improving air quality for many residents here in the Valley, especially, you know, as some wildfires are starting to impact the valley and as winter PM 2.5 season is, is coming in. So definitely in support, but would just like to highlight, um, I know in what was released to the public, it says that there's enough funds, um, but just curious if any 617 fund, or if you are all anticipating any 617 funds to be used for these incentives programs. And if so, we 
definitely um, would urge that any six one seven dollars used in these communities be really focused on the electric option versus the uh, natural gas, um, again, to help improve indoor air quality overall, especially for those 617 communities. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Cynthia. No further comment in Fresno or online. Okay, I'm gonna bring it back. I see Supervisor Peterson. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, just a couple thoughts. Um, I'm not gonna speak in opposition to this today. Um, but I do have a concern, and, and it's a, you know, a growing concern with respect to supply chain issues, uh, the turnaround um, time that uh, all of our programs are being impacted by. Um, I'm sure there's some that, that are uh, less impacted than others. And you know, I, knew, I know we do a great uh, job at, at moving money around to make sure that um, you know, we're, we're hitting those areas that, that need to be addressed. But uh, I'm just curious of our grants and hey Craig, your bus you're breaking up. Okay. I see you, Craig. You're stuck. Um, I'm going to go to Buddy Mendez yeah, right now. Let's go to Supervisor Mendez first. Okay, I want to make a motion to approve. Oh, second. Did you, can you still me? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Well, I, I just have a concern on the timeline uh, with respect to how long it's taking. Okay. <laughs> Craig has a concern with. Maybe uh, we can address that. Sorry, Craig. You have a concern you want addressed, but we couldn't catch anything. I'm, anyone have an idea what I'm supposed to do right now? Mr. Chair, uh, I, I think. Uh, uh, can you guys hear me at all? Uh, we yes, we can hear you now. Very little. <laughs> Craig, we heard you had a concern. Okay, Samir. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I think the concern that's been expressed is, is just just talk over him. Is is related to the uh, the impact that supply chain issues may have on on our ability to spend money and the ability for yeah. applicants to get their projects can, done in time. Can you hear me? That now? is something that we we will. Actually, Supervisor Peterson is still pretty choppy. Um, yeah, I think there's a reception issue. If you can hear us. So what I was going to offer, uh, Mr. Chair, was that we um, we circle with uh, Supervisor Peterson on on that issue, and we we'd be happy to continue reporting out on some of the things that we're doing to try to address those concerns. This particular program is one where the the product is starting to flow, and and we are able to get these projects done. While there are some some issues, obviously across all the industries, but it is something that we'll continue keeping an eye on, and and uh, feel like we're able to move forward with these recommendations without that being an issue in terms of impacting the ability of, of us to del deliver on this program. So, we'll happy to circle back on those issues, though, as part of a broader discussion on that as well. Okay, thank you very much. We do have a motion and a second on the floor. Before I do that, I'm going to make sure that there's no one that wants to speak on this item in Fresno. No one. Thank you. Okay. There's no one here in Modesto. How about in Bakersfield? No one here in Bakersfield. All right. Thank you. So let's go ahead and call the roll. Thank you. Mr. Bessinger. Yes. Mr. Chiesa. Yes. Mr. Mendez. Yes. Dr. Pacheco Warner. Yes. Mr. Pereira. Aye. Thank you. Mr. Peterson. Aye. Thank 
you. Mr. Preciado. Yes. Ms. Shuklian? Aye. Mr. Wheeler? Yes. Thank you, motion passes. Uh, thank you very much. And then I, I said there are on the agenda, there are two more action items, but number 11, I just want uh, Samir really quick. Uh, I think we're going to continue item 11 to the October 20th meeting. And Samir, if you could just explain. Yeah, Mr. Chair, board members, we did receive some um, last minute um, suggestions and questions from the Attorney General's office on item number 11. So to ensure adequate time to look at those issues and hopefully resolve those issues, we are recommending that that item be continued to the October 20th governing board meeting. And that would be uh, your prerogative as chair of the governing board. Yep, so it will be continued to October 20th, item 11, we will continue. All right, I'm gonna go back to item 10, uh, which is to authorize the district to serve as administrator of CARB ocean going vessels at birth. Regulations, recommendations, fund for the Port of Stockton. Um, we need to get the correct presentation up. Just one second. I believe it's the second time that this has happened this to happens Mr. DeYoung here uh, <laughs> as we moved <laughs> items around. Here, here we are. And with that, Mr. DeYoung. There we go. Good morning, <laughs> uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Todd DeYoung, uh, Director of Grants and Incentives here at the Air District, uh, here this morning uh, to seek your board's authorization to submit an application to CARB to serve as an administrator of the Ships at Birth Remediation Fund for any um, activities related to the Port of Stockton. And so just by way of a very brief background on the CARB ocean going vessels at birth regulation, uh, in 2007, CARB adopted the initial control measure for ocean going vessels at birth, um, which requires uh, vessels under certain conditions to connect to emission control systems while at birth within ports in California. Um, the idea behind this regulation was to provide air quality and health benefits to people living and working near California's seaports. Based on the success of the initial regulation in 2020, CARB adopted some enhancements to the regulation with expanded requirements. Um, some of these expanded requirements now um, um, basically in, incorporated any port or marine terminal in California that receives more than 20 visits per year of what they call a regulated vessel. Um, those ports and marine uh, terminals must now comply with the 2020 regulation. Um, under the updated regulation, container, refrigerated cargo, crews, roll-on, roll-off, and tanker vessels are all required to reduce emissions while at birth in California's seaports, um, whereas bulk and general cargo vessels are not necessarily required to reduce emissions, but they still have to meet reporting requirements and other conditions under the regulation. Um, the compliance dates start in January of 2023 and are dependent on vessel types. Um, I have a, a slide later on in the presentation that shows the, the compliance start dates for the different vessel types. So based on the revised thresholds under the regulation, the Port of Stockton is now subject to the regulation, whereas it wasn't necessarily uh, subject to it uh, in the 2007 version of the, regulate, the regulation. Um, it should be noted that the types of regulated vessels that typically call on the Port of Stockton are currently limited to tanker vessels, which have a compliance date, um, compliance start date of January 1st of 2027. Uh, and of those uh, regulated tanker vessel trips, it's estimated that there are approximately 60 visits per year by those regulated vessels to the Port of Stockton. So as part of the compliance dates, um, the regulated, um, the regulated vessels must be able to connect to CARB approved emission control systems while at birth. So January 1st of the years in, in, in the table that you see before you, um, the different types of ships must be able to connect to um, emission control systems. Um, these approved systems include shore power, emission capture and control systems, otherwise known as bonnets, um, fuel cells, and then batteries. Um, at this time, I've, I've had discussions with the Port of Stockton. They're currently researching the available emission control options for the Port of Stockton. They have submitted a plan indicating that they're going to be um, installing emission control options at the port. Um, however, they have, they have um, indicated that they're working with CARB right now because of the lack of uh, certified emission control options that are available today. 
but it, they do have a 2027 deadline. And so they're going to be working over the next several years um, to install those emission control systems at the port. Um, these are just examples of the various types of emission control systems that are available. Um, the, the top two pictures are um, their shore power, where you basically plug into electric power and shut off your, your ship's engines. Um, the bottom left and bottom center are, are bonnets or emission capture and control systems. Uh, the one on the left is a um, shore mounted system and the one in the center um, is a barge mounted system. Basically, um, they capture the emissions coming out of the, um, out of the stacks on the, sh on the ships and then scrub those emissions. And then the bottom right is just a, another picture of a shore power system. So under the 2020 regulation, there is an additional compliance option added. Um, it's called the remediation fund. Um, this is available to port terminal and vessel, op vessel operators that have already made enforceable commitments to control emissions from vessels at birth. They've already made those commitments to either um, install the, the shore power or utilize the bonnet systems or any of the other um, eligible um, eligible systems. The goal of the remediation fund is to mitigate the community impact of excess emissions from vessel visits that were not able to reduce emissions to the levels required under the regulation. So to utilize the fund as an alternative option, the port or terminal must otherwise be in compliance with the regulation. They have to have done everything that they were supposed to do under the regulation in order to use the remediation fund as a, a method of compliance. Um, so in this case, um, after they've determined that they've done everything that they were supposed to do, they can request to use this fund under certain circumstances, which I'll show you on the next slide. Um, so these are the types of, of um, conditions that might uh, be eligible for the remediation fund eligibility. Um, it's where uh, terminal or port equipment needs repairs. It's been installed, but it's in need of repair. Um, and on the vessel side, same thing, if there's equipment that needs to be repaired that wouldn't allow them to, to connect and, and reduce emissions while at birth, um, delays in connecting to a con control strategy um, when a ship pulls up to the to the berth if they're not able to immediately um, um, connect to a contr control strategy that would be an eligible use for the remediation fund, construction activities, and then any um, other unavoidable uh, physical or operational constraints that may um, prevent compliance. And those all have to be approved by CARB. So once CARB approves the use of the remediation fund, either the port, the terminal, or the vessel operator can utilize the remediation fund for each hour of uncontrolled emissions during a particular vessel's visit. Um, payments into the remediation fund are made according to a schedule that are um, set forth in the regulation. Um, it, it varies by vessel type, anywhere from $1,000 per hour up to $12,500 per hour. Um, the types of tanker vessels, that call on the port of Stockton are, are subject to the lower end of that schedule. So about a thousand to $3,400 per hour um, with the types of vessels that, that call on the port of Stockton. Um, CARB estimates that the remediation fund is likely to, to generate about $11,000 per year starting in 2027. Um, this range is based on several assumptions for implementation of the emission control strategy and any potential delays. They've run scenarios and, and um, CARV has, has estimated it's about $11,000 per year at the Port of Stockton. So once, once CARB approves the final amount um, based on, on the amount of emissions and the amount of, of time uh, a particular vessel spent at birth, um, the payment is then made by the responsible party to the remediation fund administrator. And that's where we would come in. The remediation fund administrator will use the funds from this program uh, to offset the community impact of the excess emissions generated during those port visits. Um, the funds generated through the remediation fund must be used um, under the guidelines of our existing incentive programs, the Carl Moyer program, the Proposition 1B truck program, the AB 617 uh, cap funds, the community air protection program, um, and then any emission reduction strategy that's been identified in a CARB approved AB 617 uh, community emission reduction plan. Um, and then as always with all of our programs, the emission reductions have to be surplus to any regulations or rules um, that are otherwise in place. Um, so the regulation specifies who is eligible to become an administrator. 
Um, and so the entities eligible to become an administrator are air districts in California with the jurisdiction in communities adjacent to, um, to California ports. And then the um, California Air Pollution Control Officers Association or CAPCOA um, can also serve as an administrator if the air district does not um, choose to become an administrator. And then should no entities apply, then CARB um, has the option to invite nonprofit uh, organizations in the region to apply to be an administrator. Um, so the, the process we're, we're undertaking right now is CARB has notified us that we're eligible um, to apply. Um, we have 120 days to submit an application. That application deadline is actually at the end of this month. Um, the applications must include um, a description of the applicant's experience in implementing the incentive programs and then any other relevant technical experience. Um, upon approval, um, we would enter into an MOU um, with CARB to serve um, as a remediation fund administrator. Um, however, we have been in discussions both with CARB, CAPCOA, and other California air districts that have ports um, of a similar size who may not generate a tremendous amount of funding from this program. Um, uh, we've been in contact with CAPCOA. There's a potential that CAPCOA may serve as an administrator for more than one of the ports with, with small amounts of funding um, in order to um, sort of utilize an economy of scale um, um, to administer those funds on our behalf. Um, in any case, um, we would work closely with um, the administrator to identify projects um, that have a direct benefit to residents within the vicinity of the Port of Stockton. So in terms of next steps, um, upon, a board um, upon board approval today, we would submit the application by the 29th of this month to CARB to become a remediation fund administrator. Um, once approved, we would enter into that MOU with CARB, um, and then we would work very closely with the Port of Stockton to get a better idea of how much money we think can be generated through this program, and then work with the communities surrounding the Port of Stockton, including the Stockton AB 617 community to identify those potential incentive projects to mitigate those excess emissions. So with that, that concludes my presentation and I would be happy to answer any questions. Very good presentation, Todd. Uh, Member Bessinger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If I'm a shipping company and I take advantage of this. What, what, is there a commensurate reduction in fuel? Is there fuel savings that are that are substantial enough where we we can get their attention or are they saving, you know, $500 and then costing them elsewhere? Right. There, um, depending on the type of emission control system that is used, uh, for instance, shore power does have uh, significant fuel savings because basically you're shutting down those onboard engines and plugging into electrical power. Um, the concerns that I've heard is, you know, we don't want to make this like a, a pay to pollute sort of option for the, the shipping companies. So the benefit has to um, outweigh any potential um, any potential negatives. So um, there is a there is a significant savings um, and a benefit to plugging into these emission control systems in general. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Supervisor Mendez. Yeah, I just got one quick question. How come CARB isn't just doing the whole thing? That's a good question. I, I yeah. think in my, in, in my mind, um, they want to give the, the control over the types of projects down to the local level. Um, they want to make sure that, that the local air districts and the local um, um, communities have a say in the types of projects that are done, whether those are truck replacement projects, um, you know, port handling equipment. My assumption is that they want as much local control over those dollars as possible. Just another note, um, Supervisor Mendez, the actual implementation of all these programs, whether it's Moyer, Prop 1B, CAP funds, is done at the local level. So the, right. the experience in actually running these different emission reduction incentive grants is at the local air district level. Yeah. And, and then, then the other deal is it's a minuscule amount of money, so they don't care. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is. And I, on that note, by the way, the, the, the smaller the amount is, we actually prefer it was zero, to, to be honest with you, because then it means that um, the ports have installed, you know, shore power and you don't have any of these excess emissions. So our, our actual larger aim in all of this would be to, to promote that down to, you know, preferably a zero amount coming, coming our way. Good comments. Through the yeah, chair, Mr. I Rickman has joined the meeting. Perfect. I see no more board questions or comments. Let's go out to the public. 
no public comment in Fresno or online. Okay, none in Modesto and Bakersfield. No public comment in Bakersfield. Okay, bring it back to the board for action. Motion to approve. I'll second it. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Roll call, please. Mr. Bessinger? Yes. Mr. Chiesa? Yes. Mr. Mendez? Yes. Dr. Pacheco Werner? Yes. Mr. Pereira? Aye. Mr. Peterson? Aye. Mr. Preciado? Yes. Mr. Rickman? Yes. Ms. Shuklian? Aye. Mr. Wheeler? Yes. Thank you, motion passes. Hey, thank you very much. And thanks for letting me move uh, item 10 up. Now we're gonna go back to item eight, verbal report on the wildfire season. Good morning, Chair, members of the board. I'm John Claston, Director of Air Quality Science, and I'm joined by Jamie Holt, Chief Communications Officer. We're going to give you an update on the wildfire season so far in 2022 and our prevention and response efforts. So you can have the clicker. Thank you. So just a little bit of background here. As we've talked about before, emissions from wildfires can easily overwhelm all the emissions from the total mobile and industrial sources across the valley can overwhelm our control measures and the emissions from wildfires can lead to very high levels of particulate matter, can also lead to ozone concentrations that are very high since fires also produce precursors to the formation of ozone. Um, over the, the, the decades of fire suppression policies, fuel has continued to build up across the forests, widespread drought driven tree mortality, changing climate conditions, causing more intense wildfires in recent years. And we've been working closely with local, state, and federal fuel reduction efforts to, to reduce the frequency and severity of these wildfires and an ex extensive amount of public outreach. And just to give you a scope of where we are so far in the year 2022, that's all the way on the right-hand side. This is the year to date. You can see how that stacks up so far against the record-breaking years in 2020 and 2021, which were the two uh, largest wildfire seasons we've seen in California. And this is showing the total number of acres burned across across the state. So far in 2022, we've had about 350,000 acres burned. And I did want to note here that we're still right in the middle of wildfire season. It's not really over until we get a, a big storm coming through. In past years, we've had a lot of fire activity late September, October, all the way into November. So there's still the poten potential for significant activity over the next few months, which can make this bar for 2022 rise even higher. And just to make the point here, uh, about the intensity of the last two wildfire seasons. This is a list of the 20 top largest wildfires in state history and nine of the top 20 have been from the years 2020 and 2021. Those are highlighted there in red on this list. Five of the top 20 have been from the year 2020 and then four of the top 20 have been from the year 2021. And this is just evidence of the increasingly intense and destructive fire activity happening across the state. We looked at this a few months ago in June when we gave you an update on on the fire season on the left here, this is what the drought looked like across California in June. And then to the right here, just last week, here's an updated map so you can see the progression, especially in the San Joaquin Valley, where the whole valley is now in the exceptional drought category. So you can see that progression over time that uh, issues continue, conditions continue to dry across the region as we've gone through the summer season. What we're showing here is an updated list of the fires that have occurred that have been occurring across California. Um, all these fires have been have been occurring over the past few months. Uh, we, we do have an update here. The Mosquito Fire is now the largest fire. You can see that's the second one on the list there. This is in the Plaster County um, area near Lake Tahoe. This has actually increased in just the past few days to over 60,000 acres now. So it's increasing very rapidly. It's now the largest fire of the year. Um, significant amount of smoke is occurring from that fire currently. It's pushing off to the east towards Lake Tahoe, Reno, and to Nevada. Um, so they're getting significantly impacted by the smoke from those fires. And you can see the other fires that have been occurring across the state with the map on the right-hand side. 
Also, as you uh, as you probably know, just last week we had an extreme heat wave across California and the western U.S. And the hot temperatures that we experienced, of course, exacerbate fire danger conditions, drying out fuel even more. And we had prolonged high pressure over the valley. The lid over the bowl of the valley was tight on over that bowl, increasing concentrations that we already had a residual wildfire smoke in the area from fires and other pollution from other activities. And the wildfire emissions that were occurring last week under these conditions also contributed to the peak ozone values that we had. We saw some of the highest ozone the past week when we had these uh, smoke uh, from wildfires um, contributing to the valley's air quality. I did want to note here too that a number of uh, uh, um, locations across the valley um, almost hit record highs for the valley for temperatures, but for the week of the first week of September, these were the hottest temperatures we've ever seen for early September. So it's very abnormal to have temperatures this high this time of the year. And Sacramento did hit an all-time high up there at 116 degrees during this week. So looking at what happened with the air quality last week when, ha when we had these conditions, due to the very poor dispersion, high, high pressure over us, wildfire impacts, we saw some elevated PM 2.5 levels. You can see that uh, the majority of the different areas across the valley exceeded the annual a standard level of 12 micrograms, and we saw levels reaching up to 25 micrograms, which is abnormal for this time of the year. Usually we're at single digits here in the summer season, so much higher numbers, but we were able to stay below that 20 per hour standard of 35 micrograms, which was good to see. And like I mentioned before, we could have a lot of fire activity in the next few months as well, which could give us some, some higher numbers if we, if we get impacted by that smoke. Looking more closely at the hourly concentration, so instead of the 24-hour average, this is the, these are the hourly concentrations over the past couple of weeks, and you can see that we had hourly values that were much higher, over 100 micrograms at a few locations in the valley, as we saw um, some direct smoke impacts from the fires occurring in the area. Showing here just a few satellite images of, a prog of the progression of some smoke impacts from, from last week over the past few days. On the left-hand side, you can see smoke from the mosquito fire starting to come into the northern part of the valley there, circled in red. And as you go to September 9th on the next day, you can see a lot of the smoke there um, being spread across California into Nevada. You can see a big fire up in Oregon going off of the coast there. And then to the right on September 10th, you see that smoke from the Oregon fire going even more over the Pacific, which is often drawn into the California coast through the wind flow, and even more smoke there over the valley. And you can see Tropical Storm K also coming in from the south with all the cloud cover. And this next uh, slide, this all of this uh, just kind of cycle through a few times. This is September 9th, one of those days. You can see the smoke from the mosquito fire spreading across California, Nevada, coming into the valley. If you look closely, you can see some of that coming straight into the northern part of the valley, that wall of smoke um, going from north to south as the tropical storm is coming in at the same time. And this is the day that we saw High levels of PM 2.5 kind of progressed down the valley from Stockton, Modesto, Turlock, Merced, Madera. Everybody was being hit by this as the smoke poured into the valley on this day. And of course, we continue to work with land managers. We are on a, uh, a call every day with land managers. Our, our air quality forecasters uh, are part of this where we hear the different conditions. We give updates on air quality and we hear updates on fire activity and efforts. Um, we were involved with our cooperators meeting earlier this year. We continue to attend interagency collaboration meetings. And we also have a cache of temporary monitors that we can place up if communities request it. If they're being heavily impacted by wildfires, we can place those up so the community can see their local air quality data during, during these fire activities. And of course, we continue to work with land management partners to support any enhanced forest management efforts to address the fuel buildup. And I'm going to hand it over to Jamie, who's going to give us some updates on our outreach and our cleaner centers and cleaner room programs. As you all are aware, providing accurate and timely health protective air quality information is really a priority of ours. And we do that on a regular basis, even when uh, air quality is great. We're doing a lot of communication, but we really uh, 
pun intended, turn up the heat when we have the wildfire smoke that is coming into the valley. We also have a strong partnership with our local public health officers and directors. We meet with them on a regular basis just to ensure that we have uniform messages and they're aware of what's going on or what might be coming into the valley as far as wildfire smoke. We communicate with our Spanish and English language media on a daily basis. And then we also, when we send out press releases or advisories for specific incidents, we end up usually doing uh, you know, a, a handful of interviews uh, to make sure that the public has as much uh, real-time information as possible. We also communicate directly to Valley Schools. This is an example of an email that went out uh, just uh, about a week ago that gives information to schools. They are back in session on how to deal with air quality events such as wildfire smoke. And then, of course, social media, phone calls, emails, events. We're out in the Valley on a regular basis. I will say uh, last couple of weeks, we've actually been at some Valley Schools in the morning and in the uh, afternoon drop-off to pass out information that does include some of this wildfire information. Social media, of course, is very important to us. Um, we're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Nextdoor. These are just some examples of our social media posts from the last week or so. There are a lot of tools out there about air quality, and we really want folks to get their information in a way, is, in a way that is most uh, uh, accessible to them. So the first two that you see there on the left are the Valley Air app that we run. We allow uh, folks to download. It's been it's been available for several years now, both for iPhone and for Android. It's been downloaded 46,000 times. Gives real time air quality information both for ozone and PM. The third one there, that's just a weather app, and it actually pulls up air quality information coming from our monitors. The next two there are two types of uh, um, uh, data or apps or uh, websites from the EPA. Uh, the first one's Air Now. It just gives you your current air quality. The next one is the Air Now Fire and Smoke Map. And if you can see there, what's neat about the Fire and Smoke Map is it actually will give you kind of an overlay of where the smoke might be. Um, the last one there is through one of our um, our environmental justice partners. It's the SJV Air, and it pulls in both purple air and um, air quality information from our monitors. And it's a little bit of a mix of them both. One thing that's interesting, I pulled these earlier this week. Um, it's really good air quality out there right now. So uh, thanks to thanks for that and knock on wood that it stays that way, even though we're still very much in wildfire season. We do have a wildfire prevention and response page, which has a variety of tools for folks. You can reach both the fire and smoke map and our uh, real-time air advisory network gives you information on what to do to protect, protect yourself and information on the fires that are currently impacting the valley. This is just an example of some of our outreach tools. This is our infographic, and we're actually working on currently putting this into Punjabi based on some information or some um, recommendations from our AB617 communities. Our Clean Air Center's pilot program, you might recall, uh, established a, a, a grant program whereby we are hoping to set up a network of clean air centers throughout the valley where vulnerable populations can go to get a bit of a respite from wildfires, uh, smoke, or other air quality events. We have uh, uh, $750,000 in funding, and we are currently taking applications uh, the funding is allocated on a county-by-county county basis based on population. And really, any, any space that would be accessible to the public, be it a school, a community center, a senior center, sports center, libraries, any other publicly accessible building would be a prime candidate for this program. Uh, we, uh, we will take applications from both public and nonprofit partners. Uh, we have a current solicitation open that is about to close, but we do plan to open immediately another solicitation because there are a few counties that we want to make sure uh, get some of these uh, centers up and running. We have recently streamlined the program and clarified the guidelines to make it really easy for folks to participate. 
You go through the program, and basically you're getting one of these huge industrial size air purifiers. They're about the size of a big refrigerator. They're a few thousand dollars, and you're getting them for free to put in your library to turn on when air quality is poor during your normal working hours. We also are running our Clean Air Room Pilot Program. You might recall this is a program that uh, sends uh, the smaller home air purifiers directly to individuals who are living in disadvantaged communities. It's awarded on a first-come, first-served basis. Um, we have a partnership with ACE Hardware that allows those to be sent directly to their home. And these numbers, and you can see they're, they're pretty good. Um, I will say the Stanislaus number is now at 65. We've been giving them a little bit of extra TLC, um, but only through word of mouth. So far, we have, uh, I think, been very successful in just word of mouth, telling people about the program, working with our, our um, community-based organizations to get the information out there. Um, at some point, we may do some social media really targeted uh, marketing to a few zip codes, but for the most part, um, we are seeing the numbers get up there to where we want them to be. And that's a little Facebook post of someone who got a, an air purifier, if you're wondering why that dog is sitting next to an air purifier. Uh, just more information on the program. Uh, it almost anyone that uh, lives in the valley, with very few exceptions, can apply. You do have to be living in a disadvantaged community, and there are quite a few of those in the valley. Um, and it's it's free. You get an air purifier and one replacement filter. It's a really easy application online. Last but not least, I said, uh, you know, we're out there doing a lot of outreach, making sure folks are aware of these programs. Really, in the last six months, we are back in the community, back talking to folks face-to-face, uh, -face, which I think is incredibly valuable. And with that, we'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, Supervisor Wheeler. Got to unmute me. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> this uh this this is so great i just can't even tell you uh you know when i was talking earlier about the bad air we have you know here's another another prime example that when these people write these articles like in the president ob and and in the public radio and tv and stuff you know they don't they have no idea what the history is what people have done and what have you we wouldn't be having these drastic fires as bad as they were are if we would have had uh, logging going on, it, uh, it clean, cleaning up this fuel. The fuel is what's causing. I mean, they, the climate change does help. I mean, make it worse. But when you have thirty plus years of non-management in our forests, up and down the state of California, that's what makes these magnet magnitude fires. <clears throat> we just didn't have those in those days. We had droughts in the seventies that. And the bugs, the beetles came there, but we'd be defeated them because we had 120 sawmills. Now we got 20 sawmills, and people want to put money into all these different things. And every place I've been to DC or in uh, Sacramento, I tell them, you want to put money in, put money in to, to managing our forest, just pay for some sawmills. People won't put their $20 million in a sawmill when there's no guarantee from the Forest Service that they can have logs over two years unless they have a stewardship program. Which we actually got one in Yosemite Squaw RCND, which I'm chairman of, Fresno, Tulare, Madeira, and Mariposa counties. We did get one for the uh, from the Forest Service, which gives us to be able to manage up to uh, for ten years. And uh, so that's what they've got to do to do that. But the, so much of that air, dirty air, like those pictures that uh, Jamie and uh, John showed, like that one picture is actually my son-in-law is right from his house looking at that fire. That's his wood pile burning right there and i uh i went up there the next day with the force i mean the cow fire and seen over 20 homes burnt down and uh but uh but we need to clean the fuel out you know i i proposed been working on it over a year for the county to do a fuel reduction district using tot dollars <clears throat> we're going to try to get it on the november ballot but we didn't make it so we got to wait two years but between that and the forest service and cow fire, if we can start managing our forests. You know, we used, in one of your earlier programs, they're talking about buying stuff out of uh, old vegetables and, and food out of Florida. Why are we doing that? Why are we buying now? 80% uh, of our building materials are coming out of state now for our homes and buildings and stuff. 
wherein 30 years ago, it was only 20%. We cut the rest of it here, and by cutting that, not clear cuts, selected cutting, like I did in my own 40 acres up there, and when the fire comes, the creek fire come through my place, they save my cabin, and I still have 60, 65% of my trees. My neighbor's 40 acres never logged his or did any cleaning on it, and he lost 90% of his trees. So, and I took the uh, some reporters up there and showed them where the Forest Service logged and where I logged and how many more trees are left compared to the ones where they hadn't logged and been, been mismanaged for the last 30 years. So I hate to get on that bandwagon all the time, but people have got to know that. They got to know what's causing a lot of these fires and that pollution, we have no control over that. I don't care what any big ass writer from Fresno B knows everything and does nothing and says these things and and it just bugs me. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, Member Bessinger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you go back to uh, slide number three, please? I, I kind of want to make a point. Uh, in 2019, when I was the mayor of Clovis, I was part of a COG Council of Governments uh, trip back to DC. And we spoke to congressional and senatorial uh, folks about the need for loggers and fellers. And I told everybody that we would listen, we have a million dead trees in Fresno County and things are gonna go bad if we don't do something. And uh, one, one chief of staff actually kind of looked at me with a de de degree of contempt where I won't, almost wanted to put my hands on him. And the remainder of them kind of looked at us like, well, they could have cared. They, they, there was no, no, absolutely no, no concern. And the next year in 2020, boom. And then 2021. So uh, to kind of jump on Totten's wagon here, if, if we don't push the federal and state governments and the utilities to do their own cleaning, we're going to need to, this is going to continue. There's nothing we can control over it. Um, so whenever, whenever someone who claims to be an environmentalist speaks, they need to understand that this is the other part of the equation is cleaning out the stuff that's going to be dead because you can you want to save the spotted owl while well, the spotted owl went up in flames with a bunch of other wildlife. Uh, and it could have been prevented. That's all I'd say. Thank you very much, Dr. Pacheco Warner. Hi, yes, thank you. Um, so thank you so much, Jamie. Um, and I have a couple of questions. Um, one, in terms of um, some of the some of the traffic that's coming into our app, do we have data about you know or or our website um, in terms of the communication efforts that we're doing? Are people being drawn to our site or are they maybe going into one of those other um, folks that, that we mentioned? Um, um, and I know you wouldn't have the other, the other apps data, but I wonder if you have, you know, um, if you see the increase um, in traffic into our website and our app. And I'm just wondering, maybe um, trying to understand if, people are getting that data from our app or, or our website, or are they really just, you know, kind of getting it through you? And when, when, when you go on TV or the press releases or um, the social media posts, so just trying to get a sense of, of where, where people are ending up for their information, if you have any of that data. And then also, um, uh, just a huge congratulations on the, on the, um, Air, um, the portable air purifiers um, pilot program. That's fantastic that we're at 86%. Um, I really look forward to seeing some of the data that comes out of it in terms of um, uh, who were the recipients where, and I, I really look forward to seeing how um, other partners around the Valley could help elevate that program to, you know, hopefully we can continue to, to have the program and even expand it in the future. 
um, because it's just so fantastic. And and hopefully um, we can uh, get funds to tie some more uh, public education around those types of units for those that maybe don't qualify for the program but can afford one and um, and don't have one. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you for all, all you, your work on that. Dr. Pacheco Warner, just very quickly, uh, I do have one bit of data for you. When we gave this presentation or a similar presentation in July, our app download number was at 48,000. It's now at 56,000. So since June, not July, in June, uh, we have seen that increase in people downloading the app. Um, I, you're correct. I don't have any other numbers in front of me, but I can look into that. And then uh, Samir, I think, wants to weigh in. Yeah, just another quick observation that I think with, as, as Jamie did a really good job out, uh, outlining, there, there's a wealth of information now that's becoming available on, on air quality, whether it's apps or mobile web pages, and now with social media continuing to, to, to uh, and, I'm, and I'm still catching up, I think, on, in some ways on social media, but with social media um, being such a, a tremendous source of information, tremendous in magnitude and, and, and often in accuracy, uh, the, um, what we're seeing is that we're trying to meet uh, people sort of where they are too. So that while our app is an important tool and you're seeing numbers go up on, on that app, we know that now you, on Siri, you could even ask for air quality information. You may have other apps. You may use the EPA AeroNow app. There, there's actually great tools on the Fire and Smoke page that Jamie had mentioned. And so we're advertising a lot of these different tools, and we're also trying to make sure the word gets out through a very multifaceted approach. We work with media. There's TV. There's, there's all kinds of ways that folks are accessing information, and we're just trying to make sure that in whatever ways are, are available out there that this information is available and, and what we are seeing is that it, it is, it's becoming, you know, pretty ubiquitous throughout, I think, not just the Valley, but throughout the, the state as we've seen these impacts, a lot of concern, a lot of interest in what the air quality is. And we just want to make sure that folks have that information in the best ways that we can come up with. Yes. All right. Thank you very much, Samir. And, and Jamie, just so you know, there's 56,001. I just downloaded while we were sitting here, the Valley Air app. I see no more board comments, so we're going to go to the public. Any public comments? Uh, yes, we have uh, Ms. Connie Young. Yes, hello again. This is Connie Young. Thank you for this thorough report and all the good work you're doing informing our community. I appreciate that this report acknowledges the role of changing climate conditions, also known as climate change which include the worsening drought and drought-driven tree mortality. In your public education, however, you refer to, quote, recent hot and dry conditions. I encourage you to use the term climate change as part of your public education about wildfires. It's critical that the public understand the connections between climate change and wildfires in order to recognize the importance of addressing climate change as part of our response to wildfires. As a respected and trusted messenger in our community, you could have a significant impact on raising awareness about and changing public opinion about the impacts of climate change and the need to address it. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. Ms. Janet dietz -Gamay. Thank you. Climate change. I'll say it again. Climate change. Wildfires are now a summer and fall norm. We can look forward to future summer and fall wildfire events. It must be regarded as normal. We don't like to look at it that way. Sadly, through climate change, that is how it is. Summers are hotter. Each summer is hotter than the last. We are in a severe drought. The air is hot and dry. And we have dying trees due to insect infestations due to drought, due to climate change. 
These are the conditions we now must endure because we did not pay attention to climate change. I wanna thank you for updating the uh, resident, for updating the information to residents regarding air quality. I am seeing wonderful progress here. I receive air, air quality information on my phone. I look for it on my tablets, on my computer. Very helpful, thank you very much. And I'm, I'm thrilled that for cer certain populations, air purifiers are being provided. Very important. I have air purifiers in my rooms, in my home and in my cars to protect me from the air quality that sometimes is so degraded, it is hazardous to me. Thank you for clean air centers. This is extremely important. There are some of us who unfortunately do not have the luxury of air conditioning. Thank you for the clean air centers. Very important under the climate change conditions under which we now live. Climate change. This is our new normal. We need to reverse climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Ms. Jasmine Martinez. Hello, everyone. Jasmine Martinez with the Central Valley Air Quality Coalition. The San Joaquin Valley is one of the most polluted regions in the nation, and our air is made even worse by wildfire smoke. As noted in this presentation, we have continued to see an increase in wildfire intensity and impacts throughout the state. Yet they are still considered exceptional events when evaluating our attainment of federal health protective standards. This is unacceptable and alters our understanding of the air Valley residents breathe. Clean air centers, air purifiers, and public education are great resources to offer, but the district must also do everything possible to regulate the regional sources in its control since they cause and exacerbate climate change impacts, which then lead to more intense wildfires. One example of this is the dozens of oil and gas wells that were found to be leaking in Kern County that were releasing dangerous levels of methane, which has more than 80 times the warming power of CO2. The impacts that we are seeing are connected to a failure to properly regulate these sources locally. As climate change escalates, our environmental justice communities are disproportionately impacted and in need of strengthened climate resilience. Wildfires are no longer exceptional, as some of my previous commenters have noted, and they do represent the reality of the state of the air. And one question I do have for the district is, are there ways that the agency is tracking and considering wildfire emissions in our attainment plan and or in addition to it? Thank you for your comments, Jasmine. Mr. Thomas Menz. Hi, Thomas Menz again. Um, I just wanted to say a little bit about the uh, air monitoring. You know, the air actually is not very good this morning. It was, uh, we are being impacted by the mosquito fire. Uh, as I speak, you can see it pretty clearly on the map and uh, where the degradation of air quality, which at this time of the year should be in single digits and it, it's not. Uh, so by World Health Organization guidelines, uh, you know, I, I, I could go out walking this morning. Um, I know that some on the board have uh, tend to uh, distrust the, uh, you know, some of the uh, home monitoring, the purple air monitors and the like that uh, is available online. And um, I just want to say that when air quality is bad, sometimes it's better, you know, to have something that's maybe not exactly accurate within, you know, five uh, micrograms per cubic meter or so. It's better to have something that's temporar temporarily uh, accurate, something that's giving you, you know, immediate feedback, something that's only one minute old, as opposed to the regulatory monitors, which are, you know, sometimes 90 minutes old by the time you get it. Um, 
the district maintains a monitor, for instance, at Pacific College, uh, about a mile and a half from where I live. And uh, there's no way to access that data except through CARB's uh, archive, which frequently doesn't post for several hours. I look at it at five in the morning, for instance, when I go out for my run, it's not there, it's not available to me. But, you know, purple air is, it may not be as, as uh, accurate in terms of, of micrograms strictly, but it's, it's certainly more accurate than anything available anywhere else, temporally. So um, it, it would be really nice if that monitor at Pacific College, if, you know, I know that the RAN system is overburdened, that it can't be expanded from what I understand from, uh, from those who know, but, um, you know, that could, that data could be listed on the 617 site, for instance, it's a little bit outside of the 617 area, but it's, you know, it's just to the east. And uh, you could start listing that data. It is a Valley run uh, monitor after all. And it seems like Valley residents should be able to take advantage of the data provided, uh, you know, in a timely way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. Through the chair, there are no other public comments in Fresno or online. Also, Mr. Preciado, Mr. Peterson, Mr. Pereira, and Ms. Shuklian have left the meeting. Okay. Uh, and there's no one to speak here in Modesto. Anyone in Bakersfield? No speakers in Bakersfield. Okay. I'll bring it back to Dr. Pacheco Warner. Hi. Yes. Um, I, I would just ask staff to respond to some of Mr. Menz's comments, including the 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 question about the air quality here because i think there's some inaccuracies about that and i just i want to make sure that we're having the you know um that we're we're fact checking here even if we can't fact check the media we fact check here in terms of some of these comments and and also just trying to understand more because um around some of what his comments so for the rest of the board to understand around um the the timing of the um the monitoring and also the fact that some of what we're measuring does travel regionally and so regional ways in which the monitoring is set up now makes sense um just if you could speak a little bit more to that through, through the chair i can just provide a quick um response and hopefully that um satisfies the uh the, the issue there um so Air quality is kind of a relative thing at times, and so I think that um, we're definitely seeing what, what I would consider elevated conditions relative to what you would hope to see this time of the year. As Mr. Menz mentioned, you know, single-digit um, concentrations were hovering right there at, at that green to yellow sort of um, level, depending on where you are in the valley. Big parts of the valley are actually green right now. There are some parts that are just getting over that yellow. So. As compared to when you have uh, major wildfire impacts, uh, as Jamie observed, both, both for ozone and PM, we're actually relatively clean right now. But there are some, as compared to maybe what you would hope to see during this time of the year, you know, what, there, there definitely is some smoke infiltrating in the valley. But again, it's just it's not at that level that you sometimes see when you're completely smoked out by you know under the worst conditions. So I just wanted to, and it varies throughout the valley. So there's uh, there's great tools, like we mentioned, Fire and Smoke or our app, where you can actually look at their quality across different parts of, of the valley. You can access our data in real time. And by real time, it's the, the latest hour is reported, you know, several minutes after that hour on our app. I, I do know the CARB, the CARB uh, page that Mr. Menz was mentioning may be a, a, an hour or two behind, um, but you, you can actually access that data on our app or actually on the EPA's app as well um, in that quote unquote sort of real time basis where it's, it's, a, it's a bit after the hour um, and it averages that last hour and that is available on, on that app along with all the other data that was mentioned. I don't know if that fully answers the question. John, did you have anything else to add on the air monitoring side of it? Yeah, no, that, that's right, Samir. And uh, Mr. Minns, if you have any questions on how to access that data on air now or RAND, just, just please get in touch with me and I can show you. But yeah, that the, the data from the Fresno Pacific site, which measures PM 2.5 is available on those other, uh, other tools in real time. Thanks. Thank you very much. 
I think that is all we have, and this is not an action item. This was just a verbal report, so I appreciate John and Jamie. Your update, we're going to move on to item nine, receive an update on implementation of the agricultural open burn phase-out strategy. Mr. Chair, board members, well, uh, Mr. Gill worked his way up here for the presentation. Just wanted to, to give you a quick context on this one. This is a major strategy and priority for your board in, in working very closely with the Valley's agricultural community to implement the only of its kind program any, anywhere in the state or country to phase out the remaining open burning. It's a very challenging uh, project, very challenging strategy that we've been working on here for a couple of years. And because of its importance and ongoing hard work on the part of the Air District, again, primarily the hard work going, going on in the ag community itself, we want to continue to provide uh, reports on how this is going and some of the, the next steps and where, where we are in this continuing journey. And with that, I'll turn it over to our Deputy APCO, Shiraz Gill, to give this presentation. Thank, thank you, Samir. Uh, good morning, Chair, members of the board. My name is Shiraz Gill. I'm one of the deputies here, and I'll be giving you this update on the implementation of the ag burning phase out in the San Joaquin Valley. Um, so there, there's been tons of efforts by the Valley to reduce ag open burning over the years. Um, Valley does have the toughest restrictions on ag burning in the state. And, and this is primarily due to SB 705, and that only applies to the San Joaquin Valley. Through the requirements of this Senate bill and the amendments to our local rule, which is our district rule 4103 open burning rule, the San Joaquin Valley has implemented prohibitions that have significantly reduced open burning over the years. Now, the California Air Resources Board has always supported and concurred with the district burns uh, regulations. The district works very closely with CARB every time we put a report out, and they have to support and concur on these uh, requirements. Your board has also prioritized continued efforts to identify and de demonstrate new alternatives to reduce open burning emissions here in the San Juan Valley and including the phase out strategies that your board approved recently. Now, I'll walk uh, through some of the efforts that we've done to reduce agricultural open burning over the years. Again, we are the only region in the state to phase out ag open burning. Um, now, the district also operates a very comprehensive smoke management system. This is the tool that we have to make sure that open burning is, uh, when there is open burning, it's regulated. It's tightly uh, regulated through this program and uh, hugely enforced. Uh, any of these open burn piles are, are inspected uh, prior, to, uh, prior to burning. Um, now, keep in mind, uh, open burning is only allowed when there will not be an impact to air quality standards or if it's around smoke sensitive areas and it does not cause a public nuisance. Now, since 2005, the district has prohibited burning from a majority of field crops, prunings, orchard removals, and weed abatement, among other materials. And until 2014, we were getting significant uh, emission reductions. We reduced uh, ag burning by over 80%. Now, as you know, at that time, we also started losing a significant amount of biomass capacity, which was really the main method of uh, alternative to ag burning. This is where you know, uh, farms were taking their material to, uh, to biomass facilities. In the 80s, we used to have about 20 plants. We're down to five plants today. And this, this loss of biomass capacity is the main reason we've, we've had some impact to the transition away from open burning. Now, the district works very closely with, with CARB um, and other stakeholders. And over the last couple of years, we work very closely with them to develop a final phase out strategy for the remaining ag burning. Um, this also went, underwent a very robust and extensive public process well over a year worth of work, a lot of technical analysis. There were strong, strong interagency effort uh, supported by USDA, NRCS, CDFA, and also the United States EPA worked very closely with all of those agencies. Now, this step strategy that was in, put in place that was also approved by your board uh, will phase out the remaining burning by the end of 2024. Now, in developing all these technical analyses and reports and recommendations, uh, District Mage and CARB addressed some key issues um, and made sure that there were some principles that we established. First, the phase out schedules recommended to maximize reduction of tonnage of material burned as early as possible. 
and taking into account feasibility of alternatives and um, looking at the different crop strikes. For example, for vineyards where they have wire infused in the vines, we wanted to make sure that there was uh, that was taken into consideration. A little bit more time was allocated to those types of operations. Small SAG operations who also have certain challenges, uh, more fixed costs in terms of getting those operations um, uh, uh, going. Uh, we wanted to provide uh, the most flexibility and the longest time for those operations to adjust to the phase out. We also recognize that there was significant support needed to assist with this transition away from open burning and due to the limited availability of the machinery that's out there and the much higher cost of these alternatives. Now, recognizing the need for these new alternatives, your board in 2018 authorized the new Ag Burn Alternatives Grants Program. Now, this program provides uh, financial incentives to chip ag material for multiple different uh, types of things that could be done for soil incorporation, you could do land application, or take it off for site, off site for beneficial reuse. Now, since 2018, your board has allocated $25 million in local district funding to the program. And in August 2021, with strong adv local adv advocacy, your board accepted uh, over $178 million in additional state funding. To expand, expand the fleet capacity, we recognize that was going to be a very important aspect of making sure that this program is successful and to support use of new alternative practices. Now, this program is operated through a very streamlined out, uh, online process. As you can see, there's an image to the right uh, where you can just apply and fill out some questions, and, and it's a pretty, pretty easy process. Um, we also make sure that we're uh, issuing the vouchers on a timely basis. Now, there's a lot of work that had to be done, especially outreach to Valley growers. Uh, we've done a number of things in this area to make sure that people know about the program, know about the phase out. And we've also done tailored outreach to small growers. We've created a number of outreach materials, including flyers, uh, graphics, and videos. We've done outreach to trade organizations to uh, help uh, conduct webinars and uh, presentations to growers and associations. We've done press releases. We've had multiple multilingual radio advertisements. And of course, uh, we wouldn't be complete if we did not do social media outreach. Um, so, and we continue to do that. This is a very important thing to make sure that people are aware of uh, not just the phase out, but that there are incentives available for this program. And, and with that, um, you know, with our outreach, uh, uh, a number of media outlets took this story. Um, and we've had some very positive feedback. The Bakersfield.com uh, had a really good story less than a week ago uh, where the goal, they had one that said the goal is to end open field burning by growers. Success may be in the air. Um, a number of other stories that really uh, shot, uh, outlined uh, helping uh, farmers know that this phase out is happening, but that assistance is also available to farmers. So a uh, number of great stories out there about the program and the incentives available. Now uh, I'll go ahead and show a video about uh, the program that will give you an outline of the program and also show you uh, some of the uh, machinery and work. The Valley has recently received just over $178 million to support Valley farmers with the transition to stopping the historical practice of open burning. So eligible applicants include farmers that are removing orchard and vineyard uh, material so they can dispose of that ag waste. Uh, for the fleet expansion portion of the program, eligible participants include existing chipping operators, as well as large farmers who will be not only chipping their own material, but also providing services to smaller farmers nearby. The program did recently get enhanced to include an additional $100 per acre for small growers that have a total ag operation acreage of 100 acres or less in the valley. All right, thank you. Um, now, we've put significant funding towards this program, uh, and which is, which is key to the success of the program. The district relaunched the program in September 1st of 2021 when we received that additional state funding. And again, this program is to assist in the development of these alternative practices, um, increase fleet capacity. As you know, that's gonna be critical. I'll have a slide on that. 
and to offset the significant cost of implementing alternatives to open burning. So we've funded about $30 million for advanced new advanced chipping equipment, um, and we've spent $76.3 million to date to these alternative practices. So over $106 million spent to date. Now, we've had an increased demand for this uh, ag burning program since we launched um, in September 2021. We've seen a significant program, increase in program demand, nearly tripling monthly average. So we're averaging about $5.4 million in executed contracts per month. So just shows how successful this program is. And if you look at this chart year over year, the program uh, is, is increasing significantly. And we believe we're going to be, um, you know, over the next couple of few months, we're going to be continue to see significant increases of the program. So $5.4 million a month, that's, that's, that's a lot of people taking advantage of that program. Now, this is a chart that shows participation by crop type. As you can see, almonds uh, being the largest crop in the valley. Um, is, is on top with grapes, walnut, citrus, but over almost a couple of dozen types of crop types are taking advantage of the program. So you see a whole variety of, uh, of uh, crops being uh, uh, included in this program. We talked about enhanced funding being available and made available for smaller agricultural operations. Since January of 2021, your board directed that 30% available funding be initially set aside for uh, smaller agricultural operations, less than 500 acres in size. As you can see, we're doing quite better than that. The number of total valley projects less than 500 acres is 52%. Um, so that, that's really good, just making sure that we're assisting those smaller agriculture operations. And in August 2021, your board also allocated an additional $100 per acre for each funding category for ag operations less than 100 acres in size. And as you can see, we, the percentage of total valley projects under 100 acres is 22%. Um, so that's really good. And given um, the extra amount of costs associated with these smaller agriculture operations. It was very important that we ensured that there's, um, there's adequate uh, capacity to accommodate the increase in chipping. So your board allocated $30 million of new state funding for new chipping grinding equipment purchases. As you can see, and you saw from the video, these are very large equipment, um, you know, costing um, you know, north of $1 million, you know, they're very advanced technologies to deal with some of the wire, uh, the wire issues I was talking about before, and just trying to make these things do the work faster. They take a lot of beating, so these have to be situated in a way where they can handle this material. So since launch of this option in September 2021, we have significant interest from chipping contractors, and we contracted 55 pieces of equipment to date. We have uh, more than half that have been actually delivered and, and the other uh, on their way. So we've seen a rapid transition to new non-burning alternatives. Back in the 2000s, uh, you saw uh, we were uh, open burning close to 1.2 million tons of ag woody waste per year. And um, as you can see, that significantly dropped with the transition to this alternatives burning. I want to point you to where that uh, graph uh, with that uh, blue chart, as you can see, significant reductions in emissions when we launched our uh, uh, program, uh, the alternatives to ag burning program. And if you can see on the right hand side in blue, as you see open burning go down and people take advantage of our incentive program, the amount of alternatives has increased significantly. So year to date in 2022, we're on track to have the lowest amount of open burning on record. We're seeing about a 90% reduction from historical highs. And um, so yeah, the, the program is, is doing really well. So the next steps, um, the district will continue to implement the new phase out strategy. This is a multifaceted uh, approach. This includes outreach, we'll continue to do outreach, we'll continue to do our regulatory enforcement and continue to provide incentive funding. 
Um, we'll provide outreach across all Valley Ag sectors in multiple languages. We'll continue to keep focus engagement with small Valley growers. And of course, if there are, uh, you know, for the any open burning, it's tightly regulated through our smoke management system and we'll have proactive enforcement through that process. We want to assist in leveraging any other funding opportunities, uh, complementary state and federal programs such as USDA, NRCS, EQIP funding, and the CDFA Healthy Soils Program. We'll also work closely with the California Resources Board and Valley stakeholders to host the San Joaquin Valley Summit that's in, in works at the moment. We, we were trying to shoot for late 2022 or sometime in 2023. And this will share the perspectives and also showcase all the alternatives. They'll have some machinery out there um, so people can see, uh, see it in action, perhaps. Uh, we also want to provide additional public info regarding the phase out and authorized burning. We want to continue advocacy for additional funding resources. Um, that's going to be important as we uh, continue with this phase out. And we want to, and very important to note that um, we need to keep a few things in consideration given that we're facing a drought, uh, changing climate conditions, and, and of course the implementation of Sigma. So with that, um, I'll open, uh, that concludes my presentation and I'll open it to any questions or comments. Thank you for the presentation, Shiraz. Uh, Supervisor Mendez. Yeah, good, good presentation, Shiraz. One of the things that I wanna bring back up, and let's turn the history book around. Uh, I just wanna talk a little bit about the actual, I mean, you gave a description of open burning, but I don't think it was, you know, really in depth about how that actually worked. Cause you did talk about it, inspecting the piles yeah. to make sure that they just had wood waste, you know, of the crop that they were uh, right. going to burn. There was a fine per acre put into the equation. And then the other, the toughest deal is you could only burn, in fact, you should have put it in here, when the atmospheric conditions were correct right. to burn. Right. Right. Now, let's just go back. I don't know if you have information, but what was in 2021, I'll just make it easy. I'll use the central section. How many days were the atmospheric conditions actually perfect <laughs> so that you actually had a legal open burning day. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll just say qualitative, qualitatively, not that many. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> was was it under? It was under twenty, probably. Correct. I, I, I would say it's about that ballpark. There yeah. wasn't that many. Maybe not years. under ten, but probably under twenty. Yeah. Yeah, especially given the the last presentation you saw in terms of the wildfire impacts right. previous year. Yeah. So atmospheric conditions, I don't know if somebody, uh, Samir, you have somebody that could actually explain what atmospheric conditions that you can burn in. Yeah, I'll, I'll give it a shot maybe and then uh, <laughs> one class is in the back here may, may be able to add even more yeah, information. Guy yeah. Make sure you get this uh, glasses. Uh, but it's got as he works his way up here. Uh, yes, under, under state law and under our uh, board adopted rule and procedures, the the forecasting and the potential allowances for burning would be done to, would be done in a very conservative modeling situations and and under very specific criteria around making sure that any authorized burning would not in any way contribute to uh, an impact on our standards, smoke sensitive receptors, or you know that that can include schools or nearby communities, um, and uh, and under those conditions, uh, it is very difficult to to provide those allowances, and so. I want to make sure it's very clear that it, it's, it's not only the incentives and the phase out, the upcoming phase outs and the existing phase outs that are causing this rapid transition to the um, the alternatives, but it is a very strict program. There there could be very long lead times and very deep lists that often would never get approval to burn because of the strong criteria that are in place for that burning. And whenever it would be allowed, it would be under conditions where the atmospheric conditions would allow for that strong dispersion that would not. Again, you know, Southland uh, gonna rain. We know it's gonna rain. Yeah, and so that that is under state law that 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 is operated and, and is incorporated into our rules. And so that is something that um, now that we're 
uh, basically virtually phasing out open burning. Obviously, that's going to be less and lesser and lesser as the final dates come up here at the end of this year and at the end of next year. But it is important to understand that historically, that that is the way that the smoke management system was designed and, and operates. And John, I don't know if you have anything else to add on that. Yeah, just to add, um, our air quality analysis team watches this daily. This is the team that produces the air quality forecast. They make decisions on ag burning, and they watch this very closely, making sure we have proper vertical dispersion, like Samir was talking about, that that boundary layer isn't too low, that it's going to be able to disperse sub vertically and disperse in the atmosphere without hanging close to the to the valley floor, impacting any nearby residents or communities. So it's a daily process that we watch very closely. Yeah, I just wanted to emphasize that this wasn't a willy-nilly deal. There was there's some advocates that were saying the air board was allowing people to burn every day, which was totally incorrect. And uh, because I hear the same complaints you do by people who have paid the fine and are waiting in line at the time to do it, that this is a very complicated process and you guys use very strict rules and waited for the exact atmospheric conditions to be able to do it. I just want to get that out there and make sure the public understands that. I I, I think we're doing a great job moving forward with this, but sometimes you need to look back to say, how did we get here? Thank, Thank you. you. Uh Dr. Pacheco Warner. Well, thank you. And, you know, Shiraz, thank you so much. I think that there's, you know, few people that have worked so hard to get where we're at. And I know it's been such a team effort, but just huge hats off to you and your team um, for getting us here. And I mean, to, to see the um, 55 pieces of equipment um, funded, I mean, that's just amazing to think about where we started in our capacity in 2020 and where versus where we are now in terms of alternatives. And, you know, as a, as a resident of Eastern Fresno County, I see it, you know, every day when I'm out, you know, whether I'm driving North, East, you know, West, um, I see people, you know, chipping, I see people um, doing whole orchard recycling. And I know that that's, that's no, um, that's taken a lot of effort on everybody's part. Um, one of the things that I'd like to see um, when we, you know, this is an important year, end of year um, for us in this, in this phase out um, as, as we reach some of these deadlines here. Um, I'd really like to see how, you know, in terms of some of these numbers of what is being turned over, you know, how many permits and all that, um, I know that that some of this was very specific to the type of um, open burning. So um, vineyards uh, had their had their own um, goals. Citrus orchards had their own goals, um, and and so I'd like to and you know orchard removals had their own goals. So I'd like to see some of that um, some of the data sort of parsed out in terms of. Um, what are those goalposts for those specific um, uh, uh, goals that that we're that we're setting to see how we're doing on that piece? And you know, um, obviously, you know, we we were all concerned with some of the um, some of the 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 lack of facts on some of these recent um, reporting. But I I do want to note that you know. If somebody is saying that you know they think they're gonna um, you know they're going to burn because they don't want to use incentives or don't have access to using the incentives, I think we need some sort of um, way to move forward when that's happening. And the only thing that I can think of right now is um, you know if in your end of the year reporting you know um, on how how we're doing. If you can also include any enforcement data in terms of like, you know, how many complaints that there's been on and versus, you know, how much actually ended up being illegal burning, because I feel like we need some sort of data to see if there is actually warranted um, for maybe increased enforcement fees um, to, to sort of make sure that people um, know that it's more cost effective to use these alternatives than to burn illegally. Um, but but to do that without data just feels, you know, 
um, misguided. So, you know, any sort of data that you could provide us in your next report out on um, what we're actually, what our enforcement teams actually seeing out there um, in terms of when they get calls versus, you know, how much of it actually is illegal um, would be helpful um, to, to see how we move forward uh, because obviously it's only gonna get more restrictive from here um, and, and definitely wanna continue to advocate for those incentives to keep coming absolutely um, because we've seen how, how much um, yield they're getting us in terms of our air, um, but also wanna make sure that, um, that we, we have the other side you know, uh, going through as well. And yeah, and please let me know if, if I need to clarify anything, but mostly just want to see like the data in terms of how much um, of those, of the permits of the, um, how much progress we're making on each of the independent um, uh, crop guideposts that we have, you know, the goals that we have, and then, um, and then also wanting to see any any enforcement data um, that might help us understand whether people are complying or, or not um, with the new restrictions. Thank you. Mr. Chair, if I could just quickly respond to that and then we can circle back um, and provide even more information you know, down, down the road that the, the purpose of this report is to, is to actually share a lot, a lot of what I think Dr. Pacheco Warner is, is talking about. Maybe if I could just ask the staff to put the slide deck back on want to just clarify some information and I think it's a great idea by um, Dr. Pacheco Warner with additional information that could be provided that I think would put a finer point on, on I think where um, the inquiry is going, but I wanted to go back to slide number 14 and focus a bit more on the, the, the blue box, both on the left and the right hand side. As what you'll see in, in 2022, it's really small, so it's hard to see, but that really small bar in 2022 year to date is how much burning by by basically crop type has actually occurred this year. And, and the reason it's small is because that, that amount is relatively small. It's, as Shiraz mentioned, it's the lowest year on, on record to date. And with, uh, heading into the uh, residential wood burning season with the wildfire smoke impacts, just to make a prediction, kind of looking ahead to, towards the rest of the year, it's going to be very difficult to see. Um, and again, to Supervisor Mendez's point as well, under the strict requirements, both under our smoke management system, as well as with the phase outs, um, that number is not going to move very much between now and, and the end of the year. And so we are on track to a very, very relatively low number, and that's going to get even lower as the uh, deadline at the end of this year comes into place. And then we have another deadline at the end of next year, both primarily impacting smaller growing operations. As, as Shiraz mentioned, those were the the, the design of the phase out. So that is by basically by crop type. You'll see, for example, in green, the um, the vineyard number is, is extremely low compared to where it was over the last uh, several years. The, the one thing that we could do is there were projections that were embedded in, in the board's action on, on this. These numbers are far beating or lower than what the, the projections were, but it, I think it would be helpful maybe to see a little bit more information about yeah. how it's doing versus what those projections were. So I think that's sort of where I, I take that, so, that suggestion. I think it's a good one, but I just wanted sorry, to, for the, the public record here. But also, I'm sorry, what I meant also was um, in terms of some of this, like I see the, the, the crop type, but we're, but it's also not clear to me about, you know, um, and I could even just tell you like, it's table, table two dash one on in the final report, um, the, the recommendations on ag burning. Um, it just, you know, to try to make sure that we know like, oh, it's not a small amount because people aren't doing it. It's just because it's, you know, this is where we're, we should be at on the prohibition. So that it's somehow tied to, um, so that the, we, we see the crop types, but we also see like where we're supposed to be at with, um, with the prohibition. So um, uh, thank you, Dr. Pacheco Warner. And I actually, you're, we're on the same wavelength because what I was about to lead into was the second part of the uh, of the, uh, the the slide 14, which is the, the graph on the right. And again, where I think more information would be helpful in making this point, which is that you actually see a direct tracking of tonnage of material that isn't being burned, which is that big reduction that you see in 2022 year year to date. 
and then a massive increase in the amount of material that is now being processed through alternatives in the basically in those same quantities that otherwise would have been burned in the past. That now that material on the far right there can also be broken down by and actually there is a table in the prior slide. I think it's uh which I think would be more easily communicated if we were to overlay these things and, and present it in, in that way, but where you can see different tons of material that are being handled through alternatives. Um, and, and so you can actually see very clearly this direct transition. And as you noted as well, even just driving around the valley, there isn't large non-compliance. We, we're happy to bring in you know some enforcement data on that as well, but it's very clear here that you're seeing a direct tracking of material that is not being burned, that is now being processed through documented, verifiable, alternatives that primarily consist actually of chipping and incorporating back into the ground. By far, that's the largest practice that is being uh, conducted by growers. So I think those are great ideas. We can keep presenting on that. This is fully intended to actually convey exactly what you just said, but I think there are ways that we can continue to look for, for enhanced uh, ways of doing that. So re really appreciate your ideas on that. Okay. I think that is all I have. Uh, so we will go to the public. We have public comments. Cynthia Pinto Cabrera. Hello again, Cynthia Pinto Cabrera of the Central Valley Air Quality Coalition. Um, and we are we're clearly approaching the 20 year mark of SB 705, the legislation that was written to phase out agricultural burning. And the reductions highlighted today, while well, they're great, they should have happened years ago. And this is just another example of prioritizing industry over health of residents who for years have asked for ag burning to be phased out along with notifications and other basic protections. And CVAC has been closely engaged on this issue and continues to see a lack of action for community protections and notifications. And outstanding, this has been an outstanding ask from community members most impacted by ag burns, which include environmental justice communities, farm working families, low income communities and communities of color. An example being um, Madera County and South Fresno County that have faced 70 tons of PM 2.5 between the years of 2017 and 2019 versus predominantly white communities like Clovis who experienced an average of one ton a year. This is a disproportionate impact that affect, affected a lot of environmental justice communities that was not addressed in a timely manner. Secondly, we, we continue to be concerned about the prioritization of larger operations. As stated, 22% um, of funds have been allocated to operations under 100 acres. While this is an improvement from the 11% reported in February of this year, we still think it's significantly low and we encourage the continued increase and in outreach for those operations that are under 100 acres and ask that we continue to reserve funding for small farmers as well as black and indigenous farmers of color. The first come first serve process that is typically run at Valley Air puts these operations at a disadvantage. These farmers who operate with less than 100 acres are the least likely to be able to afford the upfront investments or in these agrological solutions. Um, and continue to be impacted by these costs and our scale to minimize their contribution to our air pollution problems. We continue to, to request that that be increased in supporting those small operations. And as we continue to move forward to complete the phase out of agricultural burning, we must ensure that it's being done in an equitable way that, prioritizing, that prioritizes these small operations and the black and indigenous farmers of color who are being most impacted by this phase out and support the protections of communities who have waited 20 years for this phase out to happen. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Ms. Janet beetz -Kamay. Thank you. Sadly, the population in the San Joaquin Valley is expanding beyond the farming communities. It is expanding to now urban and suburban communities. And these are back to back with agriculture. This is not an ideal situation. In fact, I'm not even sure why we have the fifth largest city in California position in a heavily agricultural environment, but that's how it is. And every source of pollution 
the urban pollution, the agricultural pollution is filling our basin with unhealthy air. And that's just how it is. This program is wonderful. It, it will help considerably in reducing the pollutants, especially for those families who are directly involved in the farming community. Biomass is not the answer. And I, um, I'm dismayed whenever that word enters into the discussion. Locally, we have Rio Bravo. Rio Bravo is positioned right next to two elementary schools and two communities. Biomass <laughs> does not reduce PM 2.5. This program is very ha helpful, reducing the agricultural burning in the valley, introducing the uh, chips and, and ground materials back into the ground. I would like to point out that I use purple air because it tells me the quality of air exactly at the moment and exactly where I am. And it may be a little elevated, but it is very helpful to me because I have avoided air pollution sickness ever since I have a purple air monitor in my backyard. So I just want to support that purple air. If you want information right this moment at right where you are, purple air is the way to go. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Mr. Thomas Menz. Yes, Thomas Menz again, um, still a resident of Fresno County. And um, I reside in what has been historically one of the higher allocation zones for ag burning in Fresno County. And it would be nice if staff could post online public notice of all approved ag burns the evening prior and post those permitted burns with their location. Uh, it's not that difficult or onerous, onerous a request, and it's certainly not unreasonable. I would note that staff already makes its determination of burn status by 5 p.m. the day prior and posts that online, and sometimes errors in doing so, so uh, prematurely, not taking into account the air quality status and PM25 levels of the entire 24-hour period, sometimes resulting in both agricultural and residential burning on days which, in hindsight, burning should not have been allowed under the terms of the commitments made in the PM25 implementation plan. And I would hope that um, meteorological determinations for the burning curtailment status are taking notice of the PM25 monitoring in the AB617 areas like South Fresno which are showing significantly higher winter PM25 levels than the designated regulatory monitors in uh, urban Fresno and Clovis. Uh, returning to the Pacific College monitor just for a moment, which is showing moderately polluted conditions at this hour, according to Air Now, which isn't good enough for those of us who follow H World Health Organization guidelines not good enough for us to go out and increase our air volume that we're taking into our lungs by a factor of eight or 10 times the resting respiratory rate. And uh, while air now does provide a color and AQI, it doesn't provide a numerical PM25 value. And I also have reason to believe that air now, air now does not update the air quality data that they provide in the same timely way that the air district is able to with the RAN system or with the monitoring on the 617 community page, which is as up to date as can be with any BAM monitoring data in providing an average value of the previous hour. But since Pacific College is a district monitor, it would really be nice if we could get that PM25 value from the district someplace. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. No more public comment online. Okay. We and do have a public a... comment. I we have one public comment in Fresno. Thank you. Or, I'm sorry, two public comments in Fresno. Good 
Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Roger Isom. I'm the president and CEO of the Western Agricultural Processors Association. I want to start by thanking the district for this presentation. Uh, there's been a lot of misinformation put out here recently. I, I think this presentation highlights the facts and it gives a complete picture of exactly what's happened. The fact of the matter is ag has not sat by and done nothing on ag burning, has not got away from not complying. The fact of the matter is we've worked hard to try to find solutions and try to resolve this issue. The district in their chart, in their presentation, and in their comments highlight the issue, and that was the elimination of the biomass plants. As those go away, that is when the burning came back because there was no feasible way to address this. This issue is going to be exacerbated next month with the shutdown or the tentative closure of Rio Bravo. Where do we go with this material? We worked hard with the district and the ARB and the legislature to find funding for these to incorporate uh, the chips into the soil, and that's great, and it really has helped. But that funding is not in perpetuity. We have to address this the long-term solution. And if it's not going to be biomass plants, then it has to be some type of alternative, whether that's renewable diesel, uh, cellulosic ethanol, biochar, or other projects that we have to find a solution. With that in mind, I would encourage the district, their resources board, industry, and other advocates to reinvigorate the Clean Biomass Collaborative. We kind of went off the charts with that earlier this year when we canceled the, the summit. We need to bring that back. We need a long-term solution on this issue. So again, I just want to thank the district and recognize for putting factual information out. It's unfortunate that KVPR and public radio did not paint the entire picture. It's a disservice to the members of this public and everybody involved. You need to understand the whole issue so that we can work together to resolve it. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Good morning, Manuel Cunha, VK Farmers League. First, um, I want to thank Samir, Shiraz, John, and everybody for the facts. Um, smoke management was started in 1993. 93. Some of the people that commented weren't even born. They don't even know what the hell a smoke management program was. And we have not done like the wildfires have done in the last two years, three years. The campfire burned people, human beings, melted cars. Farms that were allowed to burn with the smoke never did any of that. But none of the environmentalists talk about the wildfire damage that is done to the communities, the endangered species, the communities that live in the forest in those areas have been devastated. But the only thing they focus on is agriculture. I don't know of any environmentalist that hasn't eaten ag food at all. If they have, they've been living on pine nuts. Like I said, they've been burned down. I'm just disappointed in the way that the press has put this story out there. And I would imagine that right now there's probably been only two or three, and maybe Todd can help me, how many burn issuance were done this year. But I do know that there's 300 or 400,000 acres of wildfires that have destroyed and have caused a lot of damage. But two or three farmers that have permits to burn are very small farmers. We have a guideline. And small farmers, and I don't like always hearing people that don't even know what a farmer is, say that under color in these small communities, farmers aren't getting a chance. I represent a hell of a lot of small farmers and a lot of African-American farmers and Latino farmers. And they are being informed that they're part of that. What has killed the small farmer is Sacramento regulators. The legislation that they've adopted has made these small farmers go out of business. It's not been the air district not providing funds. I make sure that every time we have funds available, that small farmers are 100% included. And the district has been cooperative on that 100%. I just don't like these environmentalists to think they know agriculture and they don't know a damn thing about it. And I am for once and I'm just so tired of it, but I don't like what the media has done in NPR and it's people that did the stories. I even on the farm tractor program did a disservice. Didn't even ask the question. Yeah, farmer that had a tier three tractor didn't qualify for funds because the program doesn't take out tier three tractors. Why don't we ask the facts? 
from the media side rather than just making conclusions. So again, I give this entire board all the credit from 1993 when you did the smoke management program. You did one hell of a job to now. So thank you, Samir, your entire staff, and Shiraz and everybody, and especially the board. Thank you. And buddy, sorry for the way that you've been treated in that story. You don't deserve that one damn bit. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. No further comment in Fresno. Bakersfield, any comment? No comment in Bakersfield. None in Modesto. Very good. All right, uh, Supervisor Wheeler. Got to get unmuted. <laughs> Otherwise, I've been talking to all of them. Uh, thank you, Manuel. 100% true. The uh, <clears throat> when they were talking about some of this stuff, you know, they don't. Also, he you forgot to add deaths. You know, we've lost some people in California this year from the wildfires. And uh, I just want everybody to know that all eight Valley counties wrote letters uh, telling the governor to make sure they keep Rio Bravo uh, uh, open. It, uh, without those uh, biomass plants, I don't know where these people think these millions of trees that don't burn are gonna go because the Forest Service has let well, it's not the foresters' fault. They've actually put some of them up for sale, but this that one a whole uh, Chad Hansen of the Biomass Diversity Group sues the Forest Service every time they put up a uh, uh, project to stop the logging and and saving some of those trees before they rot. You know, uh, he's 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 a PhD and he's never lived in the mountains, never logged a day in his life, but he's an expert on it. Many city folks they believe it that uh, NPR believes it, uh, that writer in the Fresno Bee believes it, and uh, they don't realize that uh, what happens when those trees die and rot, how easily they burn. I mean, they're just like kindling, and any little lightning, uh, dumb people come up and throw their cigarettes out or build a campfire when it's totally illegal in the summer, and then they wonder where all the smoke comes. And uh, so we need those uh, biomass plants really, really badly. And, uh, and I agree with you, Manuel. They treated, they treated the whole board and Buddy uh, really terrible in some of these uh, articles and stuff because they have no idea what they're even talking about. They do the homework a little bit and not think about today, think about what's happened in the last 30 years. They wouldn't be talking that way. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, I see no more comments. So um, this, we just received this report. So I'm gonna go ahead and close item nine. We've done 10, uh, 11 was put off. It was continued to October 20th. I'm gonna go to item 12, review and set the agenda for the November 22nd governing board study session for education and strategic planning purposes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, board members. I'll give a really quick um, presentation on, on this item. First, just wanted to remind the, the board and, and the public that we are uh, planning on hosting the 2022 study session at Wonder Valley Ranch in, in Sanger, which is uh, uh, near Dr. Pacheco Warner's, actually, uh, that's uh, her area of, of residence. We're excited to be able to host this here locally and invite the public to be a part of this meeting. It's on November 9th and 10th, and it is a great opportunity for in a bit more of a casual uh, setting, uh, talk about some of the big strategic items that may be facing the board in the coming year and beyond. We do have in the uh, board memo a list of some of the potential items that we're recommending for inclusion in the study session agenda. This, this item is to have more discussion on this. If there's any other ideas that the board may have on, on the agenda, this would be a great time to, to bring those up. I will quickly go over this list. These have come about through various conversations that have happened over the course of the last uh, several years and some of the big ticket items that um, seem to be ripe for conversation with our board. Uh, I'll start with number one, uh, talking about uh, an opinion survey to help inform our outreach uh, and uh, air quality management strategies. Your board has always placed a high priority on really understanding where the public is and uh, where the priorities are from the from the perception of the of the public with respect to air quality. So we do from time to time go out and conduct uh, scientific surveys as to where those opinions are, and it's often been very helpful in in uh, developing the strategies that we implement here. 
so that would be a big conversation about that and what the next steps would be with that. We just had a great conversation about wildfire prevention and response. Uh, by the November meeting will be a lot deeper and hopefully at the end uh, of the uh, wildfire season and knock on wood on, on, on that because we do know that sometimes that extends beyond that early November time frame. But we'll have an opportunity to talk about a lot of the same issues that we talked about today, but more up, in a more up, updated fashion and maybe even have uh, the Forest Service, CAL FIRE and others come in to speak about some of the efforts with all the new funding, the billions in funding that is being made available at the state level and with some of the federal programs what's actually happening, what is being done in the forest and what are some of the key issues to consider there. Number three is to talk about air quality research priorities and the potential of hosting an air quality symposium here in the Valley to talk about some of the latest challenges that we have and where the research can build that nexus to the strategy side of what we all do. Uh, that is some, an area where the board has been very involved in, in the past and we wanna bring up to date recommendations and ideas on how to further the air quality science that is so important in everything that we do here. Number four, which is talking about the extreme drought impacts, is something that's been coming up, obviously, a lot in the San Joaquin Valley with our board and many other sectors of, of the valley with respect to sigma, the extended drought, some of the impacts and overlap between what happens with respect to implementing sigma, the following of fields, and some of the work that we have done over the years to really try to reduce, for example, dust activities as related to to the way uh, land is managed. So this would be a great place to hear from some of the researchers hear from agriculture, other stakeholders, and really talk about where, where do we go from here as we move forward with uh, implementation of SIGMA and our related measures, including our conservation management practice program. Number five is to continue discussing Clean Air Act implementation uh, issues, challenges, and opportunities. Uh, this is a very ongoing, important topic for our board and, and the public to really hear about where we are with of uh, ozone PM 2.5, some of the really key Clean Air Act issues that we continue to try to navigate our way through and uh, really bring the board and the public up to speed uh, on where these different policies are and what are some of the opportunities to continue moving forward with our, our various obligations under, under the Clean Air Act. Number six would be uh, uh, an item to talk about our work culture here, the STAR work culture, service, teamwork, attitude, and respect. It's a very important component of, of how we do what we do in terms of providing the exceptional service that we we are very proud to to uh, provide to our our stakeholders, those that we serve, those that we we try to help with all of our different programs. And so this is a great opportunity for hearing about this program, where it's at today. It's a constantly evolving and constantly improving program in terms of how we integrate and and keep it fresh with all the new ideas and in that spirit of excellence and continuous improvement always. Are excited to talk about this and get ideas for making it even be better into the future. So that'll be the purpose of that item. Number seven would be to talk, talk about and receive an update on climate assessments and initiatives. A lot going on in, in this area. You've heard a number of times today some of the various um, related pieces and, and the ongoing interest by the board in talking about how how that work is going as well as how do we take advantage and what sort of potential co-beneficial opportunities are there with our challenges, with our mandates in terms of the Clean Air Act and our various requirements that we have to meet and some of the, the goals that we have and all these various initiatives that have strong overlap with what we do. And so hopefully with this item, we're able to hear from researchers, from agencies, and obviously from our board and the public on how we can work even better into the future to address uh, these various challenges that we have in front of us. Number eight would be to talk about our Healthier Living Schools program. That's been a very high priority for, for your board, and there's a lot of activity going on there. Number nine on the list here would be to talk about the Community Air Protection Program and the funding that we implement uh, in, in, that, in that program. There's a lot of activity going on. You already heard today about a number of the things, the Burn Cleaner Program and some of the other areas where we continue working very closely with our community steering committees and implementing some very innovative programs there. There's a lot of funding that we need to spend by very specific dates under, under state law. And so we definitely want to talk about where we are with implementing these different programs and what are some of the ideas to make sure that we're ensuring the effective and timely use of, of these different funds. Number 10 would be to talk about the ongoing community engagement efforts. There, there's a lot of different uh, methods that we use and a lot of different forms of engagement that we have with different communities throughout the Valley to really get them in, in, involved and and supported in, in, in our clean air mission. So we're gonna uh, talk to the board about what these different efforts entail and hopefully get some more ideas on how to even 
further enhance our community engagement. Number 11 would be an opportunity for the district to talk about our di different information technology initiatives. There's a lot of improvements that we're making with respect to technology and making our programs more accessible to the public and really providing that exceptional service to the public. So that's a more of a showcase item, but also an opportunity to hear some ideas as well as the things that we may want to do into the future in that space. There's item number 12, which is hearing from CARB and EPA and having good engagement with them on these various things that we do, how they could be helpful to our, our mission and what we could do to support the work that they do as well. So that's going to be, as it has been in the past, a great opportunity for that engagement to occur. And then lastly, hearing from the, uh, the Air District's Employees Association and having engagement with them. We have a great relationship with our staff, and it's always um, a wonderful opportunity to hear from the staff directly and, and have that engagement. And with that, that was my quick version of summary of the items that we have on the potential agenda for the study session. This item would be to set that meeting, um, which, it, which is already included on the, on the calendar, but also um, set, set the agenda for the, um, for the meeting. I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair and Board. Okay, so I don't see any Board comments. And I, I guess the, uh, have you reached out to, did something go out to the board members asking if they wanted anything else included or um, on on the agenda? Yeah, yeah. no, we, we've definitely been polling for these items going back, you know, several months now. And, and these are items that um, in some way, shape or form have come up as ideas, you know, whether in prior, in prior meetings or in other conversations that have come up around items of interest. So that this represents my understanding of where the interests are of the board on this, but it's always happy. It's a great time, but there's other ideas to add to this list or subtract from the list as well. Okay, so those are the proposed topics. If anyone has any changes now, not the time I'd tell you to just to send an email to Samir, uh, but it sounds like a very long and definitely in-depth uh, look at all the issues. And I think that's all we have to do, right? Review and set the agenda. So that's done, we don't have to vote on this. No, there's no vote required on this. Yeah, thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much for that update, Samir. And we're gonna move on to item 13, verbal update on district efforts to enhance new source review and emissions reduction credit banking rules. And introduce Morgan Lambert, our deputy APCA, who's been working on this issue with the uh, the permitting team. Um, he's gonna give a quick uh, version of the, uh, the presentation. This is just a staff update. So um, we could just provide that really quickly and move on to the next item. Yeah, with my quick update, I, I, I swear to have you out of here by one o'clock. So, <laughs> uh, quickly is a little bit of background. Um, the district has a long history of developing and implementing air quality strategies with numerous plans that achieve significant emission reductions through um, what EPA has found to be the most stringent rules in the nation, as well as our innovative clean air incentive programs. And through those efforts, uh, we've been successful. Um, in reducing ozone and PM 2.5 uh, emissions significantly, and also have made significant progress in meeting health-based uh, federal air quality standards. Um, the district also implements a permitting program that's designed under state law to ensure that on a regional basis, we have no net increase in emissions from new and modified sources. So basically what that means is as we see uh, you know, new facilities coming into the valley and or modifications, we ensure that we're not impeding our progress towards attaining the health-based standards. Um, kind of the, the main uh, uh, permitting rule that we have that, that meets those objectives is our, dis our new source review rule, which is District Rule 2201, um, and it's designed both to meet federal and state new source review requirements, and it's subject to the most uh, um, rigorous NSR requirements due to the district's attainment status, particularly for ozone. Um, some of the key elements in this rule include the requirement uh, that all uh, or most um, new and modified sources install best available control technology, uh, that emissions be offset when, when uh, the emissions from a project or facility are above certain uh, thresholds. Um, we have or we have historically operated a federal offset equivalency system uh, because some of the requirements between state offsetting and federal offsetting are, are different. And so we've had a program that's um, demonstrated that historically we've been able to satisfy federal offsetting through an equivalency system. And then we also have public notification requirements that um, once a, which is basically a period that before an authority construct is issued, uh, it goes out for public notice to garner uh, comments on the projects. And that's when certain projects are above certain specified thresholds. Going back just a little bit, 
uh, to add a little bit of uh, clarity on why we're, we're talking about this, uh, back in 2019, the CAR board directed their staff to conduct a review of the district ERC program in response to some current concerns that the environmental advocacy, advocacy organizations had. Um, they conducted that re review with uh, significant district involvement um, over about an 18-month period. Uh, in June, um, after that extensive review in June of 2020, the CAR board uh, held a hearing and approved their staff's recommendations, which included a commitment to support the district in enhancing um, our ERC pr program moving forward. Uh, in terms of that review, obviously the district appreciates CARB's general recognition of the stringency of the air quality programs that we've operated here and the success in reducing emissions. Um, CARB's review did, however, point to the need to revisit and potentially enhance certain aspects of our ERC and offset equivalency program moving forward. And uh, the district made a series of specific commitments in response to that review um, aimed at enhancing transparency, rigor, and public engagement surrounding those programs. And those were uh, part, uh, part of the, the, um, the package that were adopted by the, by the CARB board. And since that time, um, the district and your board has been diligent in implementing these commitments and taking a series of actions uh, to substantially meet those commitments in close coordination with CARB and EPA. And Due to those uh, those efforts, the district has now transitioned kind of from that the initial ERC review response mode now into a rulemaking effort um, to formalize some of the changes that have been put into place um, uh, and have been implemented through actions by your board and to satisfy other elements to ensure uh, federal requirements can continue to be met. Um, moving forward, uh, the district is currently um, pursuing a, a multi-path approach to address the federal offsetting issue. In accordance with our the current rule that we have and the remedies that we have within the, that rule, um, the district is now in the process of amending that rule to move to a full federal offsetting system for NOx and VOC. Um, and while maintaining the existing equivalency system or some version thereof uh, for both P or for PM, SOx, and CO. Um, and the reason for this this bifurcated approach is mainly dealing with. Um, the the district's NSR rule is much more stringent when it comes to particulate matter SOX and CO in terms of the thresholds we use, the types of projects that we require to be offset. Um, we are no longer uh, significantly more stringent on the VOC and NOx side, uh, and that uh, corresponded to when we went to extreme non-attainment, um, the federal standards came in line with the, with the local district standards, and so we no longer enjoy um, that increased stringency there and are now at a point where we need to move to the federal offsetting uh, approach. Um, along with the, that, or, or to, to affect those those changes, um, some of the amendments that we're looking at and will need to do um, in, include adopting the full federal program for NOx and VOC, associated amendments to offsetting methodologies, exemptions, and other requirements um, to conform with the federal requirements. And then also we need to make some, uh, um, some amendments to the uh, offsetting equivalency remedies that are within the rule for um, PM, SOX, and CO. As part of these efforts and, and the reviews that we've done over the last several years, we have identified some, um, some areas that we felt needed enhancement moving forward to ensure that those programs um, that we were going to continue with the federal offsetting uh, mode uh, were sufficiently, had sufficient safeguards to ensure that those um, did in fact uh, meet federal equivalency and when they didn't had a, a, a pathway to transition over to federal equivalency or, or to federal offsetting. Um, these uh, proposed amendments will also be necessary to satisfy recent EPA action on uh, the 2019 version of the district NSR rule. So back in 2019, um, the board adopted revisions to our rule to address some minor approvability issues that were related to the 2016 revisions to the rule. Um, uh, uh, the, the big issues that we dealt with at the time, um, one was to enhance a two, PM 2.5 precursor demonstration for ammonia. Um, basically, what we, what we needed to do at that time was to do an analysis and a demonstration that ammonia wasn't a, a significant precursor in the context of uh, major source permitting and therefore didn't, wasn't subject to the federal NSR requirements. We had done that review as part of the 2016 revisions. However, almost immediately after we submitted those, EPA um, updated their guidance and published uh, a new a set of guidance materials. And so we needed to go back and actually make changes to conform with the new guidance and do the analysis consistent with EPA's new guidance. There was also some issues related to uh, the definitions of what are called routine replacement emission units and temporary replacement emission units. 
so that that rule after adoption in August was submitted in 2019 uh, to EPA. Um, you know, fast forward a couple of years now, in July of 2022, EPA uh, finally uh, proposed a limited approval, limited disapproval um, of that that version of the rule. Uh, we're currently awaiting final EPA action on the rule. The public commenting period has ended on that uh, proposed action, and we're waiting for them to uh, um, uh, finalize that action. So along with some of the issues that I, I talked about regarding offsetting, uh, while the, 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 the proposed action that EPA took um, generally affirms most aspects uh, of the, the district's NSR rule, um, and, and, on the, and, and on the issue of the precursor analysis, they did find that agreed with our analysis that ammonia wasn't a significant precursor. They did identify some additional approvability areas, um, which we must address now during our current Rule 2201 uh, rule amendment process. Um, first of those was to include certain federal NSR definitions. Um, this is really uh, necessitated now by the change to the full federal offsetting program for NOx and VOC. Um, some of these definitions weren't necessary to be included in our rule previously. Now they are required to be. Um, we implement those implicitly now through our implementation and our transition to full federal um, program, but now we need to explicitly put them within our rule. Uh, there's also a need to include um, a requirement uh, on uh, the evaluation of federal for, uh, federal visibility requirements. Um, this is currently enforced through a, a uh, federal implementation plan that's in effect for air districts within California. EPA has now asked that we explicitly include those requirements within our rule for, for transparency purposes. Um, we also need to do a new analysis of our minor source uh, NOx and VOC public noticing thresholds. We have a series of thresholds within our rule um, that uh, require public noticing. You know, all major sources are required to public notice their projects, and a host of, of minor sources are also required to do that. Um, EPA is asking for an updated analysis uh, of that um, to continue to demonstrate that the thresholds are at the appropriate levels. Um, we also need to remove what's called an interpollutant offset trading uh, program for ozone precursors. And, and basically what that meant was when offsets were required for certain, uh, for certain pollutants, like for NOx, for example, um, under prior EPA rules and guidelines, you could trade like VOC for that. So you could not just have to do NOx, you could use other pollutants to potentially allow that offset setting. Um, recently, EPA lost a court case um, that basically invalidated that approach. And so now we need to remove that from, from our rule as well. Um, we also uh, need to do some revisions to our routine replacement emission unit and temporary replacement emission unit uh, definitions. This has been an ongoing challenge as we've tried to uh, thread the needle between um, at times conflicting state and federal NSR requirements. And so uh, we've been continuing to work with CARB and EPA on, on landing um, these definitions in a, in a way that satisfies both the set of requirements. And there are some other minor, minor administrative issues that we'll be handling through the rulemaking process as well. Um, we are also working on amendments to our ERC banking rule. Um, these amendments uh, will include um, some changes to administrative mechanisms, definitions, and procedures for the filing of applications and the banking of ERCs. Um, and this is really surrounding the issue of timely application submittal and to clarify um, some uh, rule language that was vague in our current rules um, and that was flagged by, by ARB during their review. Um, we're also working on some other administrative mechanisms and definitions and procedures um, for the banking of other credible emission reductions um, with the hope that there will be uh, the, the enhanced availability um, to bring new credits into the banks that will be able to be used by facilities as they pursue either new facilities or modifications to facilities that do trigger offsetting. And then lastly, we're looking at the removal of the, um, uh, the future banking of new greenhouse gas emission reduction credits. We put this uh, provision in our rule many years ago before a lot of the other methodologies and mechanisms were out there like cap and trade. Um, and this is just a, a provision that's not very uh, heavily used. And there were some questions surrounding um, those that came up during the ERC uh, review by CARB as well. In terms of uh, the ongoing public engagement and process, we held an initial scoping meeting back in April. We held the first workshop on these efforts in June. 
The next workshop is scheduled for October um, with the idea that we will be bringing uh, the rulemaking package um, uh, to your board for consideration in early first quarter of next year. And as we go through this process, obviously there's a set of milestones and workshops, but we're doing other ongoing participation and stakeholder engagement throughout the process and welcoming, welcoming any comments we have along the way. Um, so with that, uh, um, we'll go ahead and turn it back over to your board for any uh, comments or questions. That was nice and fast, Morgan. I appreciate that. And, and I, this, again, is just a uh, verbal update. I don't see any board members uh, with any questions. And, and so we will accept that. There's still more work to be done, but I uh, appreciate you uh, letting us know. All right. I'm going to move on to item 14, which is a verbal report from the California Air Resources Board and Dr. Pacheco Warner. Yes, thank you so much, Chair. Um, and um, thank you again um, for all of the work and the progress on the, um, the ag burning again as a, as a CARB and SJV effort, I think, um, while other members of CARB weren't here, I do want to just, you know, put my other hat to just kind of um, thank the district for, for all of their efforts in, in making that happen. Um, I do want to say that um, we have um, some important things coming up this fall, uh, one of which in the um, upcoming in the that specifically mentioned the San Joaquin Valley um, will be at our next um, board meeting, which is next week, um, which will be our, uh, our, the consideration of the state um, implementation plan. So the, the 22, 2022 strat state strategy for the SIP. And so, um, there you will see the commitments that um, CARB is making um, for that reduc those reductions um, to come to not just our, um, our district, but all the districts. And I do um, just want to emphasize that we want to make those successful um, to see those um, reductions happen, um, the commitments that are being made at the state at the same time that we want to make sure that um, we're looking for any further opportunities at the state and federal level to uh, reduce emissions here in the Valley. Um, we are also in the October meeting, um, just want to flag, we'll be um, hearing, um, doing our first hearing for the advanced clean fleets um, uh, regulation, which would um, put us on a pathway for um, more, uh, zero emission, um, uh, medium heavy duty uh, vehicles, and uh, again, of significant impact to the Valley in terms of the reductions that we are um, set to see, but then also um, significant important challenges um, that I think are important. And I, I'll certainly be asking questions about um, in terms of how we can actually make this um, the targets on the advanced clean fleet successful in places like the San Joaquin Valley where we actually need the reductions. So that's coming up on, that first hearing is coming up on October 27th. And um, that is all I have. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, just a quick uh, related um, comment. Just wanted to... Um, I think Dr. Pacheco Warner, she, she's been in all these different actions that are impacting the Valley, has been really um, making sure that our, our needs are heavily advocated for, um, you know, so that the, the item that's coming up here very soon is a very important one on the state SIP update. And so I just want to um, just su support, you know, those ongoing efforts by, by her to make sure that we, we do get quantified reductions that we can include in our in our plan and appreciate CARB's work on that as well as Chair, Chair Randolph and and working closely with with um, Dr. Pacheco Warner and myself, and, and looking at these issues, we, we will need those reductions as we put our ozone plan and other plans together. So, just wanted to acknowledge the importance of that item, and just appreciate her, uh, Dr. Pacheco Warner's efforts on that, and and also in the, the equity lens on the upcoming measures, making sure that um, as we think about some of these zero emission transitions, that these, it's done in a way where communities are actually 
pulled forward and not left behind and that there's really strong consideration for how to make sure all, all of our various communities and small businesses are able to actually participate and be a part of this this uh, the solution. So just appreciate and want to recognize those efforts. Yeah, and I'm not sure I say it enough, but I appreciate uh, all your hard work, Dr. Pacheco Warner, uh, representing us at the state level. I do appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, on to item 15, Executive Director Report. Just have one update. I believe, uh, Ryan, would you mind um, working your way up here? <laughs> he didn't know I was going to do this but I, I wanted to embarrass him a little bit. Uh, I wanted to announce to the board that we have uh, appointed uh, Ryan Buchanan to be our new director of administrative services, uh, overseeing our finance team, a lot, number of other functions. Really excited for him. He's a great part of our team, has been here for a while, uh, has built up a great team under him, and just really excited to present him now in this new role and uh, all the great things to come from him and his team. Congrats, Ryan. Yes, thank you, Samir. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Um, I've, I'm very privileged to have this opportunity, and, and really, I thank Samir and, and thank Morgan and uh, Shiraz and Ryan for this uh, opportunity to work closer with you guys and work closer with the board. Um, buddy, I'm sure you've seen a couple of my budget presentations, and <laughs> so very familiar with that, and I look forward to doing it again next year as the director. So thank you. Thank you much. Okay, on to governing board member comments. Looking, 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 and I see no board comments. Uh, so I, I guess I'll quickly get get the last word, but uh, Brian, John, Jamie, Shiraz, Todd, Morgan, Samir, uh, Adriana, I, I wanna thank you all for your presentation today. I, I know we were trying to push things along because we had some issues with the quorum. Uh, to the public participants, uh, appreciate uh, the board members for taking time out. Again, everyone is busy. This is important business today. I, I see that we have 27,000 uh, burn cleaner program uh, grants that we've given out. We talk about the ships, we talk about ag burning, and we're doing good. And again, the speed is never fast enough for some, and it's way too fast for others, and balance is what we do. Uh, we try and balance the needs and interests. And uh, so uh, I just appreciate everyone taking time. Uh, item 17 is a closed session. The governing board will hold a closed session pursuant to the Ralph Brown Act. And Annette, shall I turn it over to you? Sure. Uh, the closed session is conference with legal counsel on the pending litigation of um, the district versus ag land joint venture. Uh, that's in Fresno County Superior Court. This is just an update um, that will be provided in closed session on this litigation. So no action is going to be requested or taken in closed session. And um, so no need for public comment on the item. Very good. I appreciate everyone. We're going to go ahead and I'm going to close this meeting down and we'll adjourn to closed session. Thank you.